Hello everybody, and welcome once again to another addition to my One Piece journey. I'm really excited to be talking to you again today, thank you so much for joining me, and today we're going to be talking about Skypiea, the Skypiea arc, um, to follow the Jaya arc, the wonderful Jaya arc. This arc is gigantic, uh, similar to Alabasta, potentially even longer, I think it's going to end up being longer, so this is part one of my Skypiea review. This video will cover chapters 237 through until and including chapter 277. I've been told that's a great stopping point, I happen to agree, bereft of context obviously, so that's what this is going to be covering. Skypiea as a whole uh, is just very dense with a lot of things, and though I think that it'll get denser towards the climax, that's just how I feel it will end up playing out, uh, there is still lots to talk about here, and still far too much to do one video for the whole arc. So this is part one. As always, if you want to check out part two, the next video, uh, that is available for early access on Patreon for just $5 patrons, um, if you want a little bit of something extra. No obligation, of course. If you'd like to join in on the live read-throughs, where I stream every single chapter of the entire series on Twitch, uh, and if you want to take part and join in chat and share your insight or just watch and watch someone else vicariously experience hopefully one of your favorite stories, by all means, you can follow me on Twitch where I stream One Piece Reads uh, every other Friday and Sundays uh, in conjunction with Anime Reactions, which will be starting again soon. Maybe they'll have started by the time this video comes out. The current Twitch schedule is always in the pinned comment. If you'd like to join the Discord where people like to talk about all sorts of things, um, and experience One Piece and talk about the show, the movies, the manga, obviously, uh, other stuff, ongoing stuff, other things, whatever, there's tons of channels in there, uh, feel free to join the Discord, link is in the description and pinned comment as well. But to start off, just like always, we're going to be talking about the AJ Peace comments, of which there are quite a few, thank you guys for sending in a lot of them. This is for part two of Alabasta, the conclusion of Alabasta, so naturally uh, there is a lot of thought food there, so I appreciate you guys sharing your insight as always. Just so you're aware, I did read a couple of these, just skim through them really quickly, and some of them I won't have much to comment on, I just wanted to sort of highlight what the commenter said because I think it's really substantial or beautiful or insightful. So apologies, a couple of these won't have much of a response from me, but I did want to highlight them. First one is from Thomas Oliva. I believe that this arc makes with Vivi the polar opposite of some themes of the East Blue, in saying that dying for your dreams is easier than living to see it fulfilled, or realized. I think that is what Luffy meant when he scolded Vivi for putting her life at risk, because she couldn't think of any other way. It's not about dying, it's about believing at every step with 100% conviction that you will reach that impossible goal, so that in the face of your death, you can smile and still believe in your dreams. That's a lovely little complexion that's added to that interaction and relationship between Luffy and Vivi. I love the idea that it's not necessarily, in and of itself, the fact that Vivi could die. Uh, obviously, they're trying to prevent that, the crew and Luffy in particular, but dying prior to your dreams being fulfilled means that those dreams cannot be fulfilled, obviously. And so, I really like the idea that Luffy is scolding her or disagreeing with her or disappointed with her at that point in time, not because, not just because she's being reckless, but because if the only way of you being able to carry out your dream is putting your life at risk in a way that would mean that you wouldn't be able to see the fruits of your labor, that is a little defeatist maybe, a little not not confident enough in yourself or uh, on your comrades or your friends, your nakama, etc. I think that Luffy would like her to believe not only that she can achieve her dream, but that she would be able to see it fulfilled. I think Luffy would like her to believe in a bit more uh, idealism here. And so, uh, I love that idea. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Next is from Flint, who says, Zoro's fight against Mr. One was about him growing into someone who not only fights for the sake of growing stronger, but for the sake of protecting his comrades. Mr. One says he does not consider himself a swordsman. His blade lacks subtlety, not even capable of tasks like mining. Koshiro says the strongest sword can protect and destroy what it wants. Mr. One cannot protect anything, only destroy. And while Zoro considers himself a swordsman, by only fighting for himself, he was no different than Mr. One. But while on the brink of death, he thinks thinks not of how to cut steel, but of his comrades. Are they safe? Most of them are quite a bit weaker than him, after all. If he, one of the strongest members of the crew, is struggling this much, then what about them? It's after that that Zoro picks up his blade, not to destroy, but to protect, and was able to overcome Mr. One's challenge. Learning to cut diamonds would be a waste because it's not threatening his comrades right now, but if that time ever comes, he'll become a man that can cut even diamonds. 
Uh, and just like the previous comment, this is a lovely interpretation and one that I buy into as well of that Zoro moment. I talked, uh, I think peripherally, but didn't really delve super deep into what exactly the sentiment of that line itself was. I talked a lot about Zoro's aura and how he seemed to be able to gain this understanding of all things, like I like I described it. And we'll talk about that uh, again later in the Skypea stuff. But I don't think I delved much into him thinking of his friends and how he came to this realization, outside of li looking back at the flashback. This comment puts it into a lovely perspective, and I totally agree, and I love that. The desire to protect, as well as attacking, is what makes one strong. And Zoro, I think, was able to come to terms with that here. And it really lends a lot of promise for the future, like, will this continue? Was this the one epiphany Zoro needed, or is there more on the horizon? I imagine there would be more given how epic and sprawling and long the story is, uh, but this was a huge first step. And I love that Zoro had it as well. Him and Luffy learn in so many ways, uh, or progress in so many different ways from their defeats to Mihawk and Sir Croc, respectively. Uh, and I love that they diverge, because they learn such different things. Uh, learning to protect your comrades, that's something that I think Luffy didn't really need a lesson in much, outside of what Vivi sort of imparted onto him in Drum Island, uh, prior to his defeat, obviously. But I think that this is something that he had ingrained already to an extent, and just had to fine fine tune, polish, etc. But Zoro, this is definitely a lesson that he himself needed to learn and it converges really nicely with his growing attachment and bonds with the rest of the crew. Next is from uh, Matthias, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing that, Matthias, Matthias, blank. Something about Crocodile that I always wonder is that I'm not 100% sure that what he was looking for was strength. He seemed to be a frustrated pirate that couldn't go further in the Grand Line, so he decided to make his desert island even drier, or this desert island, so as to create a field in which his powers are stronger. He was also looking for this super powerful weapon, but as I interpret the rain falling after his defeat, that means he was using his powers to keep the rain from falling, and that could only take some concentration and strength from him, so that he was weaker than he could be. More than looking for strength, I think he was deeply afraid of water. To which, but I don't usually include these, uh, and I don't plan to in the future, but Evelyn commented something beneath it as well, uh, where they talk about there are, some, there are lots of subtle little subtextual details to Sir Croc that makes you wonder and could lend insight into deeper aspects of his character or where his character could go or where he's come from. Like, Evelyn talks about uh, the scar across his face, the loss of his hand, he could easily be traumatized, uh, which I definitely agree with. I talked a lot last video about how Sir Crocodile definitely seems to have learned some harsh lessons that he applies to how he looks upon dreamers and connections. And so Evelyn talks about that as well, how he seems to be afraid of trust, potentially after losing comrades or something like that. So yeah, this is a lovely comment and a really great reply as well that I think is really cool. It's a cool spin on Crocodile because, you know, I talked before about how he's so prideful. He's so, uh, he definitely flaunts and he's definitely overbearing with telling people that he's superior. You know, he's very prideful. And like I said, people who are totally secure with their power don't tend to do that. And so I love the idea that if you add these details, his scar, his hands gone, his inability to trust people, the idea that he could easily have been holding back the rain himself in the way that uh, Matthias or Matthias surmises, him not being able to go further in the Grand Line, that sort of idea, the fact that he created this kingdom built around him uh, due to fear, due to fear of water because of how it lowered his status, so to speak, lowered his power. And so it's a fine distinction that even though his power and influence was lowered because of this sort of thing and he wanted to create this vacuum where he himself was this god, it's not due to him desiring power for power itself, uh, potentially, this is, a, this is an interpretation, but it could lean more on the fact that he was just scared and power was the way to make him forget that fear or overcome it. And that's some pretty deep subtext to Sir Crocodile that I really love, so thank you for bringing that up. Like I said, the AGP's comments for this video, for Alabaster Part 2, you guys knocked it out of the park. Thank you so much. Next one is a question from Meloron Neff. Would you consider doing a video series like this for other popular series such as Jojo's Bizarre Adventure or Naruto? Uh, Naruto? Sorry, I, ne I hardly ever say that out loud. I would consider it, but I would need, like, these 
these videos and the streams from Twitch and everything that goes into it, uh, the community is so much of what makes this a meaningful experience. If I was just talking and no one was interacting as well, uh, I would just do it on my own. You know, I would just do it on my own. I'd tweet about it occasionally. That's about it. But because of the comments and the stream chatters and people on Twitter and my DMs or whatever giving me uh, insight and helping me out one way or another or sharing my enthusiasm, just watching, all of that is so wonderful that I'd really need some encouragement that, for example, a read-through of Naruto would be similar and that people would be interested, essentially, and would be interacting with it. So, firstly, there's no way I'd be able to do two of these series going parallel. So, this is for the far future once I'm done with this One Piece series and once I'm back, once I'm hopefully catch up to weekly stuff where I can talk about it, uh, maybe in chunks, maybe as they release but when we're more or less up to date. So a long form read through series isn't possible until then. But I would be down to do another after this because it's been lots of fun as long as people are interested. So let me know um, if you'd be interested in another read through uh, series like this for another series. Uh, ideally one that has a pretty enthusiastic fan base uh, who would be interested in stuff like this and one that's a bit longer because if I do one of these series for one or two videos that's not quite what I'm really looking for for this sort of thing, so at least a little bit longer. Uh, those are the two requirements I'd sort of think about. The ones that come to mind immediately would be potentially Bleach or Naruto. I'd be down to do this for either of those two series, but it can't be for JoJo's Bizarre Adventure because uh, I'm already caught up with the anime for that, so uh, it wouldn't really work for that. But yeah, please let me know if you'd like me to do this for a different sort of series, uh, and if so, which series? And then this one's just really lovely. Braulio Garcia says, At the end of the banquet when everyone's laughing, I recalled how Luffy said that if this were Vivi's kingdom, she'd be laughing a lot more. And now you can say that this is indeed her kingdom. Nothing to add. That is just beautiful. Uh, last couple here. This is from Fame Time, who says, One thing that I noticed throughout these videos is that you don't really talk about the Devil Fruits all that much. I personally find them very interesting, and they're a big part of the series for me. Just a few questions relating to them. What are your thoughts on Devil Fruits as a whole? Do you think they have a big impact on the story and characters, or are they just a way for Oda to express creativity? Uh, I'll just answer them in turn. Firstly, uh, something in between. I don't think that they have a huge, gigantic impact on the series or story, quite yet, but they're definitely there for more than just creativity. There are definitely ways in which they indirectly characterize uh, the characters for which they apply to. We've talked about Luffy's, we talked about Bellamy's, for example, recently in the Jaya arc, we talked about Sir Crocodile and its applications. You know, they are a vehicle for creativity, I think that's pretty clear, but they do have substance to them, and they do apply to characterization. Then number two says, do you think that some of the Straw Hats will get Devil Fruits in the future? So outside of Luffy... Um, Robin and Chopper. Other ones getting them in the future. I can't say that I've thought too much about that. I can't say I've theorized th internally or externally that that would happen. So, I mean, now that you've asked that, maybe? <laughs> maybe? Uh, it's not something I've really thought about. But I guess it's possible. Uh, I Sorry, I don't really have a concrete answer for that. Though I would say that if it does happen, I hope Usopp does not eat one. I don't want Usopp with powers. I want Usopp to stay exactly as he is. The cowardly, everyman-esque human uh, with no powers and who gets by purely in the way that he gets by. And number three, what are your top five devil fruits in the series so far? This one I don't know how to answer. So, you know, like you allude to, I don't talk too much about devil fruits in these videos. I do talk about them a decent amount. Like, I, I spend several minutes on them per video, I think, but comparatively in a ratio compared to everything else I talk about, it, they definitely aren't the main focus. And that's simply because they don't interest me as much as the other stuff. Um, you know, I like them. They're fine. They add to the world, like I said. They're interesting. They can indirectly characterize. But I'd be lying, and I'm just going to be straight up, I'd be lying if uh, I said that I think they're an amazing power system or uh, an amazing element of the world. I think they're good. I think they contribute. I like them. They're solid. But definitely not anywhere close to my favorite power systems in fiction or even just shonen. Uh, they're good. They're they're solid, you know. But they don't wow me, and because of that, I'm not very passionate about them. I don't. I'm not gonna pretend that I am. I don't want to be fake to you guys. And so as a result, I, you know, I rank the characters because I'm passionate about character ranking. I rank the arcs sometimes because uh, I'm passionate about these self-contained stories, but I'm not passionate about Devil Fruits at the moment, so I don't know how I'd rank them, to be honest. I, I can't really say I have a top five. 
Uh, Luffy's would be up there for sure. Crocs would be up there, I guess. Robin's almost purely for aesthetic. I love the element of uh, darkness it adds to her. And that weird grotesque nature to the disembodied hands. And then to round it off, let's just go with aces and smokers. Smokers would probably be like top three or so. But yeah, I don't have a defined top five. Sorry about that. That I just came up with that on the spot. I could be forgetting something. And the last one is from Marcus Henry, who says, I like the fact that you mentioned Nami being important without necessarily having combat ability. This is the one thing I do love about uh, One Piece especially. It makes other characters that aren't combat efficient or physically strong have agency outside of fighting. You cannot survive this adventure on strength alone, and I believe that Oda highlights that very well. The reason why this mention was important to me was because I feel like a lot of other series fail at giving other characters who aren't strong agency or importance within the series. In turn, the longer a series tends to go, with the escalation issue, the more support characters fall to the wayside. You are not the only one that didn't like that Pell didn't die, that's a common position for the majority of the fandom. Both in service of the narrative and logically it doesn't make sense. Mind you, this is the same series where Zoro's childhood friend died from falling down the steps. It's hard to suspend your disbelief for something like that. I think it's okay to like a series and not like everything about the series, and criticize it when something you don't like happens. I'm glad you're being honest and I love these reviews. I'm really glad you enjoy them, Marcus, and Marcus is a patron. This was a early access AJP, so thank you for your support. But yeah, another one I don't have too much to add, other than, yeah, I'm gonna be completely honest. I'm Like I said before, I'm not gonna dwell on negatives or flaws that I see in the series, because I just don't have too much fun talking about them. I just like, I would rather talk about what I enjoy. Uh, and what I'm passionate about, but I'm not going to not mention them. Uh, it would be a bit skewed to not mention them. I'm not a critique, so I'm not going to focus on them, but I am going to mention them when things that I don't like come up. I have so far, and I will continue to in the future. And so, yeah, Pell's death. I've seen some people play devil's advocate for the for reasons for why it uh, can get a bit of a pass narratively. For me, I respect that for sure. It doesn't get a pass. It's something I am fairly certain about that it's a problem, it's a flaw, it's not huge, but it's significant enough to merit talking about, and it was very disappointing for me. But uh, Alabasta still, up until now, my favorite arc, so not like it's a huge blemish on it or anything like that. And then yeah, the Nami stuff, yeah, I really, uh, I'm glad that Oda is able to give characters agency and importance and power uh, within the narrative in so many different ways, because that's just how life is. It's very honest, it's very genuine. So that's all for the AJP's comments, like I said, lots of great ones. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of AJP's in the future, if you'd like your comment to be highlighted, just be sure to use the hashtag uh, that's on the screen right now. And just a reminder, I do read all of them, even if they don't all get selected. But yeah, with that long introduction out of the way, um, Skypia, part one of Skypia. As is the case with Alabasta, I won't be able to make thematic conclusions about what I think exactly this arc is saying because it's not finished and uh, there's still the climax to come, at least 10, 20, maybe 30 chapters. And so I'm going to talk about these themes and I'm going to dwell on them as always. That's a huge part of these reviews, but uh, I'm, I can't, it's going to be a bit more scattershot. I'm just going to say this is an idea, this is another, uh, and I won't be able to con to offer conclusions about them just yet. Part two is where I'll say this is the message I get from it for sure. But Skypea, uh, stylistically, very, a bit different, you know? Skypea feels like a detour. Uh, a lot of people have said that, and I agree. It feels like a detour, because it does nothing for the overall plot. At least not so far. Uh, it just seems like they're taking an adventure into the sky. But just because it doesn't contribute to the overarching plot of Luffy getting the One Piece, becoming the King of Pirates, them continuing to explore the Grand Line, each of their dreams specifically, while it doesn't progress that, I think a lot of it is very representative of a lot of the ideas and main messages of One Piece that Oda is trying to get across. You know, this is like an answer to Jaya. The fact that this exists alone, that this place does exist, is a miracle in and of themselves, but it was never an impossible dream. Jaya kind of shows the lonely journey, like I talked about, that dreamers face sometimes, how they can be mocked and scoffed by people who are cynical. But Skypia alone, the existence of it, kind of validates it, the fact that it exists. It validates the idea of dreaming, and it shows, and Luffy, through his fervent desire to find it, shows that it, it, these dreams can bear fruit in this world. Not all the time, but they can, and it's possible, and that possibility is enough to justify being a dreamer. And so, just the fact alone that it exists, I love it. I think it's everything that One Piece is about in one 
tiny plot element. And I'll just mention this right now, Skypiea looks wonderful. Some of the art is great. Uh, this, this grand city in the clouds above the skies, uh, where people, you know, there's these cloud seas and it's so expansive and grand. And Oda really uses the width and depth and expanse of the whole place to show off uh, so much of the weight and scope of this location. I've talked about JRPGs before, One Piece is very much reminiscent of a JRPG, and like, you, you boot up a game and you find a new area, uh, you know, this reminded me a lot of the city in the skies from The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, for example, or Skyward Sword. Those aren't, I guess those aren't really classical JRPGs, but you get what I mean. Skypiea reminds me a little bit of uh, Zeal from Chrono Trigger. And so yeah, it's got that big draw. For someone who loves exploring and immersing myself in grand, vast settings, uh, this is right up my alley uh, in terms of the setting. It's beautiful. But despite its existence alone being encouraging and uh, an optimistic note in and of itself, things are not all well there. There's internal strife between the different factions, the Shandians and the Sky People, and there's allusions to past civilizations that may have waged war as well. This may be the root of it, uh, going back to Little Garden with Dory and Broggy, and like that idea of, this war started so long ago, what are we even fighting for? Not exactly the same, but it dwells on that for sure. And so, because of the cyclical nature of this war, sides have been brainwashed in one way or another. And it all comes down to Enel, who was very oppor opportunistic, who took this chance to establish himself as this god of this place, and inserted him in a period of war, of strife, of conflict. And during those times when people are at their most unstable, when society is uprooted, that is where figures like NL can take advantage and really reap the rewards. And so we'll, we'll get into specifics like always, but there are ideas of, of ingrained culture, of how did things start to become this way, uh, of NL perpetuating this, this, these traditions of sacrifice that embeds fear so deep into people's minds that they are so scared to do uh, anything that their heart desires them to do, even if they don't agree with these things in sentiment, it's self-preservation. Fear rules over these people. And then so in situations like this, in fiction, in real life, sometimes all it takes is a third party who has not been indoctrinated into these cycles to break the cycle, to break the wheel, to break people out of it, to go against these pre-established rules. That is the crew, that is Luffy in particular, in some ways that is a bit of Ganfor, Ganfall, Ganfer, however you want, it, you want to pronounce it, uh, but not quite. So it's primarily Luffy and the crew. Uh, it's very Final Fantasy X in that way, if you if you know what I'm getting at. Won't spoil, but... And then, so there's that theme of ingrained culture and what it will take to break through and alternate perspectives and how important they are. And uh, with regards to perspective, Ganfer says something very similar. He says that heroes in one time can be considered uh, murderers in another, depending on who the victor is. You know, history is written by the victors. Balance of power always shifts. It is constantly shifting. And so it's not only a matter of perspective about whether you're a hero or not uh, during war and when it's, ha when it's happening, but when people look back on it, depending on the outcome of that war. So perspective is a big thing here. Perspective to allow you to break out of these uh, doldrums, these negative frames of thought. And then there's also the idea of balance that I've picked up on. Uh, Shura, for example, uh, one of the vassals, talks about how if one person wants to save themselves, uh, if they're destined to die, another must take their place. You know, this element of equilibrium, of sacrifices to maintain this equilibrium, uh, to, to maintain the status quo that's been established that obviously benefits NL. And then with the idea of balance, there's also the idea of the dials, which are really cool because they're really cool world-building elements uh, that are native to Skypiea that I find really interesting, but they're also an example of balance because they output what they take in. You know, you yell into a sound dial, it plays it back like a tape recording. There are impact dials, which can be used as weapons of impact uh, as they take in uh, an attack. So dials themselves are very full of balance. And so I wonder if balance will continue to be dwelt upon. Then we have Enel himself who figures himself to be this god. Again, a common theme throughout One Piece uh, that I've noticed, especially since East Blue ended, I guess. Uh, even before that, you know, you think about Arlong, you think about Wapple, you think about Sir Crocodile. What is the one thing that all these, including Enel now, have in common? Immense pride. Uh, 
uh, they are deeply prideful, and that pride is the core of a lot of their dysfunction as a person. But yeah, that aside, those are some of the ideas I got here. And like I mentioned, Skypia is like the answer to Jaya's question, almost. Uh, Jaya shows how lonely the path to dreams can be. Jaya, uh, sorry, Skypia, Skypia shows the reward, and it ends up being this adventure, this grand adventure that Cricket talked about before. And this adventure is so integrated with the idea of dreams, and like I said, is proof enough of why the, the crew choose to believe, why Luffy chooses to believe. And so that factor alone, that alone shows the importance of this arc. Uh, it is almost an encapsulation of that dream theme. And I've been told that a, that a minority skipped this arc. That's bizarre to me. But I won't talk about that too much. Like, Oda wrote it. It is at least 40, 50 chapters. So it's not like he's going to spend a year plus on something that's literally filler. And just baked into the thematics, you can understand why this isn't filler, even if it doesn't contribute to the plot. But yeah, outside of the themes, getting into the style... Uh, something I noticed is that Skypia is, outside of the fights I guess, is very dense. There is lots of text, lots of things alluding to past traditions and how these, this dogma has been established and how the people here live and the technology and the world building. It's very dense. These chapters have been the ones that take me the longest to read in One Piece. And that's not a complaint, it's just a lot of reading. It's a lot of ideas. And I enjoy that a lot. Um, but it's just a thing, it's just something I noticed, that these chapters are hugely dense. And it starts out slow in terms of pace. Uh, not in terms of quality, but in terms of pace. Uh, we are dropped into this world and we gradually, gradually learn how the world is, how society is here. We learn about the ge geographics, we learn about the people and the religion and NL. And these are all completely foreign topics that we need to learn about, so I'm glad that Oda takes his time in introducing them, because better to do that and risk, uh, run the risk of boring some readers or watchers, I wasn't bored at all by the way, but you get what I mean, than to not explain it enough and for it to feel shallow or one-dimensional or just kind of botched and too rushed. Skypiea is very dense, like I said, with text, but it's so dense with culture as well. It is a whole other world and things operate totally differently here. Tons of thought is put into it tons of thought into so many aspects of it, and so why not take your time in introducing it? I think it's very necessary to have a slow, gradual start, which is what it had and it was very effective because after those first few chapters were over, I felt fully immersed, I felt like I was prepared for whatever uh, Skype would throw at me in terms of shifting the dynamics that had been established, because a lot of what happens at Skypea, a lot of the impact, kind of results from comparing it to the way things have always been in Skypea, or the reason that things became this way. And so without properly establishing that baseline, that's kind of lost. And our crew first coming here for the first time and learning about it for the first time is a nice natural way for exposition to occur, to explain that stuff. So it's all very deliberately done by Oda, I think it's one of the more effective starts to an arc. That might be surprising to some people, but I think it's pretty solid. It's uh, very effective establishing stuff. And there are some pretty good characters so far. Uh, we have NL, who's definitely a striking antagonist. We have Konis, who's, who I like her quite a bit. Um, she, she gives you the perspective of someone who really wants to break out of this cycle, but just really can't, but just needs that push from people like Luffy to really do what her heart speaks to her to do, and then from there, you know, one person takes a stand, it's easier for the rest to follow. So Konis is very important in that way. Pagaya as well, her father. But then there's McKinley, who has been just hardly dwelt upon, but he's there, he's part of the White Berets. And then there is, uh, Wiper. There are also other Shandians like Rocky and Isa, both of whom I think are pretty cool. But Wiper is my favorite so far. This guy, we'll get into him. Um, and I hope he continues to be really good for part two of Skypea. But man, he is my favorite character in the arc so far. And it isn't particularly close. But yeah, sorry for the long intro. I guess just like Skypea tries to establish itself, I had to lay the groundwork for this Skypea uh, arc of my videos. Um, but to get into the specifics now, chronologically, in terms of cover stories, uh, we have... Wapple's cover story, which starts out very cursed, extremely cursed. He has a series of cover stories where he eats the things uh, that he wants to eat and then turns into them. There's one where he, the literal titles of the stories, the cover stories are, I eat lamps, he becomes an, a lamp. Straight, to the point, uh, you know, effective. Then there's one where he eats a bench, and that one, uh, that one's a little disturbing. 
But then he's chased out, he becomes a king no more, then slowly begins gradually establishing himself. He eats toys, he becomes an attraction for kids, he becomes corporate, he goes corporate, he begins selling things, he becomes a superpower, he uh, marries a model or something like that. And then once he goes from rags to riches, he again becomes an awful old wapple again. Very poetic, circular character arc. And he sets his sights on the world. He plans to take on the world with the influence he's gotten through sharing this stuff with the kids. Interesting cover story. Uh, again, some nightmare fuel there, but uh, it was pretty cool. And then there's this really quick check-in with Dalton in Drum Island. And I think I might have mentioned him as someone that I want to see a cover story for. If I didn't, I meant to. Uh, but he's happy, he's shoveling snow, things look to be going very well, and uh, Drum Island is doing well. So really lovely to check in there. And then we start an Ace cover story. A cover story for Portgaz D. Ace, who is on the hunt for Blackbeard. There are some misadventures, it's pretty early in, so we'll see how that goes. The first few chapters I actually think I've talked about quite a bit already in just the overall thoughts, uh, the gradual introduction the beauty of the setting aesthetically, etc. Um, so I'm not going to talk about them a ton. There might be a bit of skipping just for the sake of reducing redundancy, um, because I've already talked about this stuff just now. But Blackbeard, who tried to capture Luffy at the end of last chapter we talked about, kind of laughs at his daring and at how he was able to achieve this and how he was able to escape, again alluding to that kindred spirit nature between the two. Blackbeard's crew complain about missing the, their prey, but then... Blackbeard again alludes to fate, saying that, don't worry, we'll meet them again on the Grand Line. He seems to be very confident about this. And then Von Ogre then says, yes, the world is one gigantic, endless turning wheel. Again, lots of focus on fate in this chapter, or, uh, sorry, in Blackbeard's pirates and him. It's a very prevalent theme. But back with the crew, they surface at Skypia. The beginning of Skypia. The crew are kind of discovering this this cloud sea that they've started sailing on on top of these clouds. Usopp sort of jumps in like the beautiful idiot that he is. Luffy jumps in to try to save him like the blue beautiful idiot that he is. And there's a very comical moment as the crew just go like, shouldn't he be surfacing? How deep is this? Then Luffy and Robin kind of work together to save him as Luffy stretches his arm down deep to reach into the cloud sea for Usopp and Robin puts an I puts eyes throughout his arm so, so that, that they could see, she could see. So Luffy's arm descends through the cloud sea, Robin puts these eyes on his arm so that he, she can look, and then they eventually save Usopp. And that is very creepy imagery again associated with uh, Robin, which I like a lot. Lots of new applications of her power. Disembodied hands, creepy eyes on those on people, on other people, on those hands, potentially. Robin has a lot of dark imagery associated with her. There are some hijinks, and then eventually the crew get attacked by this man in a bull mask. The monster trio, Sanji, Zoro, and, and Luffy, uh, go to confront him to, def to defend themselves, but he just dispatches of them really easily. And when things are looking very dire, uh, a person, a, a knight, comes out of nowhere and says that he is the Sky Knight and that he'll defend them. He protects them, the guy in the bull mask runs off, and then it's revealed that the crew, the, the trio, they were dispatched of so easily, which did raise an eyebrow for me because of the altitude. The air is thin, their lungs aren't used to this altitude, so it makes lots of sense. And again, I really like that uh, Oda incorporates these scientific details that, you know, they don't have a huge presence in the story, but they just add richness and uh, consistency and believability to a lot of a lot of these elements. But the knight explains this is the white sea that they're in, 23,000 feet above the blue sea that they sail. And there's another white sea 33,000 feet above them. The sky knight then says that the man that targeted them was a guerrilla, a gorilla. Uh, I'm gonna say guerrilla because there's no distinction between how I pronounce gorilla and gorilla. Uh, so, to make it clear, Geria. But this knight says that these Geria target people and try to make them food for this skyfish. The reasons for which uh, are in not entirely clear here, just yet. The crew then explain to the knight that they took the knock upstream to get where they are here. Uh, he finds that very admirable and respects it and respects their courage and determination. So, previously he had said, you know, if you want my protection, just call upon this whistle and for 5 million X tolls, which is their currency here, I'll help you. But after hearing of their determination to ride up the knock upstream, he gives them a whistle for free for protection, which is kind of cool. And I like the detail, small little detail, that there are multiple ways to get to this kingdom in the sky, because you'd expect there would be, right? The only way to get up being this deadly coincidence that, you know, 
you need some sort of cosmic luck to even attempt. That just doesn't seem very feasible, so the fact that there are other ways to get up here uh, makes sense. As isolated as they are, uh, you would imagine that there are easier ways to get there. But this man introduces himself as Ganfer, or Ganfall, who I talked about in the beginning. And he has a pet horse bird, uh, a bird who had a horse horse fruit, named Pierre. Uh, and there's a really funny moment where the silhouette looks like this beautiful pegasus, and uh, there are hard eyes in the crew, like, wow, so majestic, and then the silhouette comes into relief, and you see what he really looks like, and he's kind of goofy. So that was a pretty funny uh, scene, but then he flies off, and the crew begin to start exploring the area and trying to make their way to different parts of Skypea. They then find this gatekeeper, this elderly woman, who says, it'll take this certain amount of money to go up to the upper yard, or the upper stratum, excuse me. But they're broke. They said, we don't have money. And then the gatekeeper says, okay, well, you can still go. I'm not going to stop you. And they go, oh, okay, cool, we'll go then. And uh, it just so happens that she didn't say you can go and you'll evade punishment. She just said she wasn't going to stop them. So what immediately happens here when they go towards the upper stratum is they become wanted criminals. And she notifies someone higher up saying that uh, the Kami, the god, and his vassals may want to know that there are people who have come who, who have illegally entered Skypea and who deserve uh, this brutal, vile punishment or heavenly judgment. Which is kind of like the first little hint we get to the fact that this place is religious, it's very cultural, it's very sacred, it's embedded in dogma. They arrive at Skypea proper, I guess, to the upper stratum. They arrive at this beach. Like I said, the visuals are beautiful, and like I said, this is very gradual stuff as things are gradually introduced. Uh, they start having fun. It's, uh, it's a lovely little scene, some nice bits of fan service. And I don't mean the swimsuit breast fan service. Uh, I mean, like, it's just really cool to see the crew interacting and having fun in a very slice-of-life way. Luffy's loving it all, it's very adorable, and there's an interesting line from Robin. She's with Zoro, and they stay behind, and they're slower to join in. And she just says to Zoro, so this is your idea of adventure. Sailing and exploring is adventure. Interesting. I've never thought of it that way before. And Zoro just gives her a weird sort of look, which is interesting because it's like, sailing and exploring. Those are like two of the first things in a world like this that would come to your mind when you think of adventuring. So Robin not really knowing this in the first place is interesting. She continues to be uh, more and more substantial and more and more engaging as a character. But then uh, Luffy tries to open up a nut, he has some difficulty with it, and someone named Konis with her fox uh, Sue go come by and help him help him out. Konis is a resident, uh, I like her a lot. Her father comes in riding this waiver, which is like the equivalent of motorcycles or jet skis, I guess, similar, um, but for Skypea. He crashes, which is very funny, and then uh, offers them to join them in a meal. And the crew are obviously up for that, so they join him. They talk a little bit of dial technology, which is how the waivers are able to function. And I already talked about them before, so I won't get into the mechanics. But yeah, it's explained and introduced here, more or less. Uh, applications would continue to be fed to the reader, uh, different applications of it throughout the rest of the arc, but the basis for it is right here. Uh, Luffy ends up trying the waiver, he fails spectacularly, and here we discover that, you know, devil fruit seasickness or aversion to water, it happens in the Sky Sea as well. Uh, but Nami, the queen that she is, ends up being a natural at riding it, so, which is very understandable given the amount of intuitiveness with regards to the conditions that you're riding in that one would need. So, yeah, I love that it's another way for Nami to shine outside of combat, and it's great. There's a bit more explanations about the world building. There are different types of clouds. There are sea clouds, which are the ones that Luffy just fell into, that they've been sailing through. And there are island clouds, which are much more solid, which house the islands. And so through all of this, we see that Skypea is not only different ge geographically from the land below, but technology is just different. Their technology has been has had to go in different diverging ways because of the requirements of living on a place like this. And that's just how... Uh, things progress, you know? It's sort of evolutionary. Technology sprouts out up where there is demand. And there are different demands when you're living in the sky compared to when you're living below, so it makes total sense that technology would diverge in this way uh, in Skypea. And so again, nice little detail that I really like. Dinner is then served, and uh, the crew then realize that Nami has not come back from testing out her waiver, or the waiver. And overlaying this, as we see Nami approach this forest of giant trees, Konis is saying, there's a place that we must never go, and that is the upper yard, the domain of the Kami. 
and Luffy hears that this place is ruled by Enel, this this uh, almighty god, that there are rules to never enter it, and uh, he learns that Nami's there, and he just he's just overtaken with his joy. I need to explore that place, I need to go there. It's restricted? Hell yeah. Um, so Luffy wants to go there. Uh, he has this pirate spirit inside him that makes him want to explore all these unexplored lands. Pagaya and Konis then say, you know, this is the god's place, this is the god's yard, and our god is not benevolent. He will smite you, he will punish you. Which is a very telling line, but Luffy is not disturbed about that at all. Now, at the same time, Nami's back with the forest, the giant trees and whatever, uh, and she essentially witnesses a hunt, where someone who trespassed the upper yard, uh, essentially stepping on the Kami's will, is hunted down by four, what we know are now the four vassals. And immediately they struck me as, like, they had enough individual difference between them to show that they're not wholly devoted to NL in a way that is uniform. Like, they have lots of individual differences, but they still seem to be following some sort of zealot-esque code, which is an interesting balance that really sort of hooked me into the vassals to understand where they were coming from. Also, I'm saying vassals, that's the viz translation. I think it's also called uh, the kami or the gods priests. But yeah, while this is happening, Nami witnesses all of that, and the White Berets, this police force uh, of sorts of... Uh, of, of the Kamis. They arrive on Angel Island, which is the beach they were just at, uh, and where Pagaya and Konis reside, and they are looking for these illegal trespassers. Now, what the White Berets say here is that you're illegally trespassing, you need to pay the fine to be a, a legal tourist. And the conversion rate between berries and uh, extols ends up leading them to need 70 million berries to become legal tourists. Conus tells the officials, tells McKinley uh, and the White Berets to give them mercy, to show them mercy, to let them be. And they just tell her to be quiet because if she doesn't, she'll be, uh, she'll be charged with aiding criminals. That's how deep this dogma spans. The crew then run away, uh, as you would expect. Pagaya and Conus are very impressed by them, and McKinley thinks to himself something very interesting, which is, I'm the friendliest of these officers. Uh, you are just making life way more difficult for yourself if you, if you do this, and you're essentially signing your own death warrant, and you're essentially, uh, you know, planning your own funeral by doing this. And it feels like there's some depth behind that statement, but uh, maybe it could, just, it could just be a shallow allusion to the vassals later on. Either way, uh, it's something I'll be putting a pin in. Oh, and I forgot to mention this earlier on, we now reach the, the chapter 243 with the Dalton Drum Island cover story. I forgot to mention that the new name of the kingdom is the Cherry Blossom Kingdom. And that is just beautiful. Nami eventually runs away and meets up with Luffy and says, uh, and Luffy's going, why'd you run away? We were going to find you. We were going to go on an adventure. Uh, very adorable again. But Nami just talks about the fear at which she felt at seeing the commies and their hunt and that she wanted to escape with her life. And then Luffy just goes, what's more important, adventure or your life? Which I found a very uh, funny, all-encompassing quote from Luffy that that's kind of him in a nutshell. And Nami, based queen as she is, says that what's most important is her life, next money, and then adventure. The crew makes arrangements with Konis to uh, leave and go back home, and she directs them to the port that they're going to have to go to. And we get some nice lines as Usopp is fixing up the ship a little bit, and he says he's a jack-of-all-trades, but he kind of, uh, you know, the crew depend on him for all manner of things, even if he isn't officially a carpenter or anything like that. Which is, you know, he exaggerates a bit and embellishes it a bit, but he's not really wrong. Usopp is definitely the prime support for so many aspects of the crew. So at this moment, uh, the crew is divided as such. Getting tools and prepping and whatever are Usopp, Sanji, and Luffy. Everyone else is on the ship, so they're separated. Uh, they're the, the, the first three are on the shore uh, with Pagaya or whatever. Now, when they're, while they're separated, a, a huge lobster appears and starts dragging the boat, the Going Mary, to who knows where. Uh, and the, then they're separated in the groups that I just mentioned. And so it's revealed that it's likely dragging them to the sacrificial altar to be sacrificed to the god. They're about to be an offering. And then Konis and Magaya explain to Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji that they have to undergo a challenge. If they pass this challenge, then they'll be able to save their friends. However, it is a perilous trek. Not like they're not used to something like that, so they say, okay, hell yeah, let's do it. And it's said in no uncertain terms that they're going to have to fight against 
uh, the Kami's vassals. And so this kicks off one of the primary elements of the plot in Skypiea, as the crew, which I guess consisted of Nami, Robin, Zoro, and Chopper, are dragged towards the sacrificial altar by the Special Lobster Express, and the other three chase after them to try to save them, as they have to undergo these challenges. So Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji begin their journey to take them back, and so they go through Lovely Street, this place called Lovely Street, to make their way over to a boat that's going to take them to the altar. And they're led through there by Konis, and they notice a lot of wary eyes upon them, obviously because they're outlaws. Now during this whole time, Luffy is not on edge at all, he's not taking it very seriously, he's just looking at the wares in the street and uh, just looking at things very bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and Sanji tells him to take things seriously. I, I think it's interesting because it could either be a, uh, an element of Luffy's ignorance, him just being tunnel vision and not being able to see the trouble that they're in, or seeing it, acknowledging it, and just not being worried because he's not the type of person to be worried about that sort of thing just because of how much confidence he has in himself. And he has confidence in the other group too, because notably he says, they're with Zoro, so they'll be okay. Now in the middle of the street they see this sort of statue, this idol, and it's described by Konis to be Verth. Uh, Luffy, you know, he's the type of person to vehemently oppose the idea of gods and idols and this sort of culture. It's just very not Luffy, as we saw uh, all the way back in Little Garden. Uh, Konis just kind of laughs and says that the, the blue, blue sea people wouldn't get it. But the tensions continue to rise, and there is this, we see McKinley looking on. There's just this weird vibe throughout the town, and we see that things are not right. And then Konis eventually gets to a point where she's kind of panicking a little bit and says, isn't it weird that I'm helping you like this, that I'm leading you towards this? Doesn't it feel like I could be leading you to your doom? And so here it's clear that she has set them up in some way. McKinley yells at her to shut up, uh, which is, you know, again, interesting. The assumption there is that McKinley is telling her to shut up so that they don't key into the plan so that they don't realize that they're in trouble. But that in conjunction with the fact that he says he's the friendliest enforcer of this law, I don't know, there may be more than meets the eye with McKinley. Konis eventually can't take it anymore, and she says that she summoned the Special Lobster Express to take them to the uh, altar. She says that if someone harbors a criminal or knows that someone's a criminal and doesn't report it, they are put to death. And Konis is distraught. She feels immense turmoil at having betrayed Luffy and friends, and just really seems to hate herself for doing this, and she says, isn't this place insane that it would force me to do this? And what I love is that all three of them wordlessly acknowledge and understand what's going on here, and they are not upset with, with her for what she did. They're upset that she gave herself away, because they said, your life was at stake, right? You had no choice but to do this, so you dummy, why did you give it away? They totally see where she's coming from, they don't blame her at all, and I love that aspect to it. It's not a betrayal to them, they understand. But now she's in trouble, she's she's branded as a traitor by everyone looking on. And Luffy says she shouldn't have said anything because then she wouldn't have been at risk. And so I love that thought process, it's so protective of her, uh, it's so empathetic. Then, out of nowhere, uh... NL's lightning comes down to strike, where Luffy and Konis were just standing. But right in the nick of time, Ganfer swooped in and saved Konis and shouts out to Luffy, I'll, I'll save her, she'll be okay, just go and do what you need to do. Ganfer extremely admirable. And he says to them, now you know the true nature of the corruption of Skypiea. Heed it well, take it in, and use it going forward. And you can tell that he's fighting tooth and nail against some sort of pre-established rules or standards, and trying to help them and you just wonder what his role in all of this is. And so the trio go off and head towards the upper yard, uh, and we see a scene with Ganfer and Konis, and Konis calls him the Kami, and we learn that he was the last god, and she begs him to come back, because this current rule is all wrong. Ganfer used to protect people from harm, like he's doing now, but as a leader, and he's been ousted by Enel. And so what happened there? How did things come to be that way? It's really interesting, and it's a great hook. And... Uh, context for Ganfer is really important because it keys you into some subtext about the backstory here. But this chapter, this was chapter 244, this seems like a turning point, like where things really ramp up and where we're exposed to the true dogma, the true corruption of Skypiea, the true culture here, and who Ganfer is, who, what Konis is like, we see that she definitely doesn't agree with the current rule. Um, and how important Luffy and co. are for trying to help break them out of it. And this sort of dogma, this cult aspect to societies like this, 
bred of fear, I think that's always a great fictional tool. It's used in a couple of stories in ways I love. Uh, Dragon Age Origins is used in a side quest there. Uh, Avatar, The Last Airbender, the bossing say, it, re it was reminiscent of that. And so I love that it's here as well, because it's something that One Piece hasn't really covered yet, but I think that the way Oda writes can lead to tons of potential for this sort of mindset, and the idealistic way that Luffy and the others see the world is just prime material for the capacity to break people out of that. But yeah, it feels like a turning point for the for the arc. Uh, it shows the true nature of what they're up against, and it really builds intrigue for NL despite never meeting him yet. And it also gives you information for the backstory, or hooks for the backstory, which I'm really fiending for, because there has to be one. With as much that is hinted at about the history of Skypiea, there has to be something. The three eventually make their way to the upper yard, uh, they get close to the altar, and they get confronted with four doors, one trial for each of the vassals. Uh, trial, they're, they're the trials of iron, ball, swamp, and string, each corresponding to a different vassal, and they choose the ball one because they say it sounds fun. Again, different trials, very video game-like. We then cut to the rest of the crew uh, who have landed at the altar. The Going Mary is in horrible, horrible condition. It's uh, been just torn apart. Uh, Zoro has, has fought off the lobster, and the art of the altar is fantastic. Now here, Zoro says that he wants to have a talk with NL. Nami says, you really want to anger the gods like that? And then Zoro says, I don't pray. Zoro has no fear within him. He says, sorry, but I just don't pray. There's no need for me to look for validation from this, or to fear this. There's nothing here that's worth fearing which is uh, such a contrast to the populace, right? Uh, that is so Zoro, it's so raw, it's very badass, but it's so diametrically opposite to the rest of the populace. One, I mean primarily, uh, thematically at least, because he has had such a different upbringing. Because he's an outsider, he's able to think this way. Because he hasn't been... Um, conditioned to think in these negative patterns. So I love that line. And then Nami says in a very humorous way, Don't listen to him, Kami. Please don't listen to him. Very fearful. She's fulfilling the every woman role that she tends to at times, uh, along with Usopp. But Robin is pretty passionate, pretty interested in the relics in the area. Uh, it's kind of cute. It's, it's kind of um, nerdy. There's a bit of a nerdy side to her throughout this arc because she's so interested in the relics. Obviously, she has personal investment in them, but there's also just a shine and a twinkle in her eye when she talks about them, which I think is really uh, kind of endearing. And she mentions that there will be jewels, so Nami comes along. They have to swing using this vine. Zoro does this Tarzan yell. Uh, I saw the anime scene for that, by the way. Hilarious. Um, Nami does the same thing, but struggles a lot. It's really cute. And then Chopper is left, poor Chopper, to guard the boat. He immediately begins panicking. So we then get what I think was a spread where we see each of the four vassals, and we get a glimpse of all of them. And uh, like I said, Luffy, Sanji, and Usopp chose the ball challenge. They find themselves in a place full of cloud balls. Uh, they find out they're hazardous. They kind of uh, can cause different sorts of damage upon impact. And it's pretty funny because Luffy and Usopp find it fun and they're playing around with the balls. One is full of poisonous, deadly snakes. One is full of, like, uh, flowers, a vase of flowers, which reminded me a little bit of Usopp's dud weapon for Nami. And then we see Satori, one of the four vassals, who is the one, the, the progenitor of this ball contest or trial or whatever. Uh, and they fight with them, and they have a very difficult time, deceptively difficult time, trying to deal with Satori's balls and this trial and this challenge. And then there's this whole dynamic where Satori sends their boat away, and they need the boat to continue to go to the altar, so they need to pass the challenge and, uh, and fight through this and survive, and not only do that, but also grab the boat. So it's a nice little thing that's happening where they alternate between confronting, uh, hiding, dodging, whatever, and there's some nice chemistry between the group as Usopp kind of ends up being the one who gets the uh, the boat in the end, and Luffy and Sanji confront Satori more directly. Uh, it's nice. It's just a generally nice fight that shows, you know, they're each wordlessly able to take on these different roles and approach this challenge in a way that best serves the group and the way that their individual qualities can come through the most. And then there's some cool applications of dials, like impact dials during the fight. Uh, it's all it's all solid. And back at the boat with Chopper by the altar, uh, he's the only one that's by the altar due to the other three going on their Tarzan adventure, and a vassal named Shura arrives to collect the sacrifices. 
and Chopper immediately panics, he has the whistle that Ganfer left them, and he blows it right away. After this, we cut to Ganfer's residence, where he's taken Conus, and he says that he's taken her out of the range of Enel's mantra. So, this is something that's essentially mentioned here as a bit of a, a hook for it, I guess. And the way, it is, the way it's explained, uh, it seems to be something very similar to N from Hunter x Hunter. Like some sort of sensory field that surrounds someone where they can sense people and movements and feelings or something within this radius. And so Ganfer's residence here seems to be outside of that, so he tells Conus that she's safe and she can't be smited by the lightning. But it's an interesting home. There are pumpkins grown there all around. Uh, and it just really brings up the question, how and why was he usurped? Uh, who is this guy, exactly? They talk a little bit about Straw Hats. Uh, Ganfer says that he is familiar with pirates and that the Straw Hats are them, are pirates. And he also says that he met one 20 years ago. So the first thing that came to mind was Shanks. Could he have potentially met Shanks when Shanks was, who knows, maybe a teenager or something? He seems to fit within the age range. That's just the first thing I thought of. But uh, who knows? But Conus, when hearing that the Straw Hats are pirates, she gets a bit upset and discouraged that they are criminals. And Ganfer drops some pretty good knowledge on her. He says that outsiders is a better term for the pirates, for the, for the Straw Hats. He says that in every uh, era, in every realm, there are people who refuse to play by the rules. And the Straw Hats just so happen to be those people in this era, in this realm, in this kingdom. And he says that Conus is the same. And depending on the rule that they are defying, that could be very villainous or that could be very heroic. It just depends on the perspective and the context. Like I said before, uh, in Jaya, the crew go against cynicism, which makes them outsiders in this age in certain areas. In Jaya, they were. Conus goes against this dogma. And so she, in the same way, is a kindred spirit with them, because they go against this dogma as well. Then Ganfer goes more into the backstory of Skypia. He talks about Shandian people, the Shandian people, and how they were always at war with the Skypian people for hundreds of years, 400 years. He says that he tried when he was Kami, when he was God, to stop the fighting, to end it peacefully, but he was usurped by Enel right before he was able to do that. So what is the origin of this war now? That really is the one question in my mind in response to what he says here. And then he says that uh, he has great shame at being usurped because of what it's led to, this horrific rule. And then he talks very briefly about an ancient legend of Skypia that eons ago, a bell rang out and signaled the beginning of the war. It was the most beautiful sound, and unfortunately it brought forth this perpetual war. But Ganfer is idealistic, like so many of our crew, and he says that, I believe it will ring again, and that once it rings again, that will signal the end of the fighting. He says, the sacred land will sing once more. I believe this with all my heart. Uh, and that immediately reminded me of Toto from Alabasta. He never stopped believing that the rain would come. Ganfer seems to never stop believing that there will be an end to this war, there will be peace, and this bell will ring out and it will signal it. Now this brings to attention is this Ganfer's dream, similar to the crew, they all have dreams. Uh, is this the dream of people, some select people throughout Skypia? Anyway, then Ganfer gets Chopper's call and he springs to duty. Back with Chopper, he is just constantly fighting against Shura, this formidable foe, and just fighting tooth and nail, and he keeps thinking to himself, I need to do this. I am nothing if I don't defend this ship. He wants to protect his comrades, he wants to live, and he also wants to protect the ship. And Shura, in response to seeing this, says, so you want to live, but you don't want anyone else to die. You don't want to give anything up? That's spoiled, is essentially what he says. And so it again brings that idea of balance, equivalent exchange almost. There must be sacrifices to appease the gods. Um, in one way or another, and if someone is saved by them, someone else has to pay the price. Again, that idea of this equilibrium, this twisted equilibrium, like Dials. And Shura then says that if Luffy and Sanji and Usopp came and defeated the Trials, uh, they would be okay. They, they would be able to leave the altar. But since Zoro, Nami, and Robin all left to explore the jungle or whatever, uh, that doesn't work anymore. It's void. And so Zoro kind of screwed it up. But this is the law. Sacrifice is the law. This is the culture. Will it be overturned? It remains to be seen. But the crew spit in the face of this sort of thing. And Chopper does here. It's the first properly big moment for Chopper for me. A big character moment where he learns uh, Usopp taught him all the way in Alabasta, right after he joined the crew after Drum Island, that 
Members of this crew defend and protect their friends' dreams, like Usopp did for Luffy in Alabasta. Chopper does the same here as he defends the, the Going Merry. Then, right in the nick of time, Chopper's struggling, still defending with courage but struggling, and Ganfer swoops in and says that Shura is a formidable foe but protects uh, Chopper. The fight continues and Shura mentions that Ganfer is a wanted criminal. We then go to this hidden cloud village where we see this group of people called the Shandians. We get introduced to this cute girl jumping around named Isa. She has Verth in her bag and she's been collecting it this sacred verth that's connected to what they seem to worship. A guy named Kamakiri tells her to be careful to not show Wiper, uh, and she's upset about that. She says, I want to defeat NL, I need verth, something like that, and she just kind of runs away. So there's this sort of council meeting or this group town meeting in this hidden cloud village where those in power, Wiper, uh, some of his subordinates or uh, comrades or whatever, they're discussing Ganfer's idea to bring peace and settle this amicably, and Wiper is not having it. He will only have retribution, because he is so hurt because of the sins uh, and the pain that has impacted the ancestors prior, his ancestors. Wiper and those around him, they think that peace can only happen through war. They need to fight and and be victorious, and that's when peace can happen. And they're very distinct. It's a very distinct culture. A lot of them have tattoos, sort of uh, interesting hairstyles. They have sort of uh, re clothing that's reminiscent of sort of tribal styles. There's a very distinct impression that we get when we first are introduced to the Shandians here, and you can immediately see they're different. They come from a different place than these sky people. Wiper then alludes to something called uh, the Light of Shandora. He says that their great ancestor, uh, Kalgara, who has a statue in the city, very similar to how there's a statue in Lovely Street of the Verth, he says that the great Kalgara's final words were to bring back the Light of Shandora. So that's what he intends to do. And the way he talks about it, it seems once again like this far-off dream. This waypoint for the lost, this light of Shandora, guiding the way for something. It's it's very vague, and I, I imagine it'll be explained later on, but the impression I get is that this is something that he, his culture, his tribe, his ancestors, Kalgara, uh, yearned for. They needed it. They It was a necessity, and they needed to bring it back, or else they'd cease to function as a society or something like that. And it feels like this sort of improbable dream, similar to how Ganfer talks about the bell, similar to how Luffy wants to become king of the pirates, Usopp wants to be a brave warrior, Nami wants to chart the whole ocean, etc. That common theme here, for the Shandians, for Wiper in particular, it is to bring back the light of Shandora. And this character is just so hurt, he is so wrought with vengeance and rage, and he wants to enact violence and war and retribution upon anyone who proclaims to be authority or a god. It doesn't matter if it's Ganfer, it doesn't matter if it's uh, Enel. He will take them down. And there's some sort of implications here that him and Ganfer know each other and are not, not necessarily sworn enemies or anything, but they don't see eye to eye and Wiper is very much the aggressor. And then a woman named Rocky brings up the idea that Konis uh, betrayed the laws and Ganfer protected her. Like, that's, that's gotten around. Word about that has gotten around. And so she says, is he really all that bad? But Wiper cannot abide that idea. He says, no, he's an enemy. They are part of our common foe. So Wiper, we see, it's established pretty clearly that he is just so possessed by this rage and it seems to consume him. And, you know, the details of where that com that comes from, kind of, we get a bit more subtext to it, but I am still kind of waiting to see where that comes from. But it's phenomenal for the character. He is immediately interesting, and he continues to be throughout the arc. Like I said, I think he's the best character so far uh, that was introduced in Skypiea. And the scene ends as we fixate on this statue of Kalgara. Meanwhile, uh, Ganfer fights Shura. He kind of gets overpowered a little bit, and it looks like he's been defeated. And Ganfer tells Chopper to defeat NL for the sake of the fallen. Um, this is something that needs to happen for the society, for for everything. It is it is their everything. And Ganfor is fatally wounded, and he falls down, and uh, he imparts that will onto Chopper a little bit. Meanwhile, though, Nami and uh, Zoro and Robin are exploring the forest, and Nami sees something through binoculars, and she goes, I cannot believe it. We don't know what she sees, it's a bit of a cliffhanger there, but uh, the reveal ends up being awesome. We'll get to that in a second. And then in the midst of all this, Konis and Bagaya ultimately end up deciding that they will help the Straw Hats. 
Pagaya doesn't give a shit about if it goes against customs or traditions or culture or the dogma. He doesn't care. He wants to help them, so does Konus. Actually, I'm not sure if he was with Konus, but either way, Pagaya says, screw it, we are going to help them. They spit in the face of this order, so do we. So ultimately, Ganfer and Pierre are defeated. Uh, he falls into the sea. Chopper falls after him to try to save him, despite going into the sea as well himself and being weak to the sea, obviously. And it seems like bad news on that front. Uh, Satori is defeated by the combined efforts of Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji. That fight had gone on for a little bit longer than I implied it did. Um, there's some great spreads. It flows very well, like I said. It's very solid. And notably, Satori says to them, This is blasphemy. I'm a, va I'm a vassal of the Kami. And they just don't care. Which sort of sums up the dynamics of the Straw Hats in Skypia. Back in the Hidden Cloud Village with the Shandians, Wiper asks Isa, the little girl, to feel something with her mantra. Again, mantra. She seems to have some innate gift for it, uh, seems to have been blessed with a talent or something, or maybe it just really worked at it, I'm not sure. But she has some special uh, ability with regards to mantra that allows her to sense more than other people can. She's something of a prodigy. And so she senses the vassal being taken out, Satori, but she also says be careful because there are unknown people, unknown presences here that have taken care of him. And uh, the Shandians go out, they go out on their excursion, and they decide that now the time is ripe to go out on the offensive towards NL. Right on cue, the two of the vassals are discussing something, I forget their names, but they're discussing something, and then the Shandians come out of nowhere, and a fight ensues between them. Then Chopper, at the same time, wakes up uh, and sees that he's at the altar, and he's unharmed, and he's okay. Then we go back with Robin, Zoro, and Nami, and Nami sees what she sees and says, I just need to get a closer look to confirm that this is what I think it is. And so what ends up happening is that what Nami saw and what they end up exploring or seeing themselves is part of Jaya. Part of Jaya was went into the sky. We see half of Cricket's house in this upper yard. Uh, it's an amazing spread we see here as it sort of dawns on us the interconnectedness between the arcs. Thematically, I already talked about it, but now in terms of like literal plot significance, Jaya used to be bigger and part of it is now in Skypea. And the initial question you think of, obviously, is how did it get up here? Um, did Jaya fall down or did, did Jaya descend or did this part of the upper yard ascend? Uh, either way, it's amazing, really cool world building and interconnectedness, and we see some southern birds. Um, my chat got a, kind of a kick out of that, seeing those birds. Uh, um, but it's such a great little thing to entice you to read more and understand exactly how things came to be this way. And so Nami concludes that Nolan's dream was very much the truth. Cricket's dream is very much the truth. He's just looking in the wrong place, he's just gotta look up instead of down. And so the representation of that dream, of the gold, of his ancestors' uh, voyage, whatever you would say, it not only exists, but it exists in this place that itself was stated to be a fantasy by those down on Jaya. That in itself is very profound. That shows the ephemeral nature of dreams, how hard they can be to reach, how obscure they can be, but nonetheless, they do exist, they can come to fruition, and this is proof. They just need to be pursued. So Nami is very excited about this. Then back with Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji, they kind of separate a little bit, and Wiper and Luffy come into contact. And Wiper sees Luffy's power and sees, uh, says that it's a, he's a Paramecia user. Uh, paramecia. It seems like it's some sort of category for it, just like the zone fruit. Uh, not sure exactly, but interesting. Eventually, all the Straw Hats are able to reunite at the altar. Uh, Chopper has gone through his whole ordeal, and he's crying, and he's going, nothing out of the ordinary happened. Uh, what a good boy. But then they say to him, it's okay, you can tell the truth, in a really lovely scene, as they comfort him, and they say, you know, just be honest, it's okay. And a lovely Usopp moment is he's checking the damage, but he says most of all, you know, the ship can be repaired, but I'm just glad you're okay to Chopper. Which, if you think about where he came from, and how he was neglected, and how he had no one really to confide in outside of Hiralook, uh, this is a watershed moment for Chopper. And it's a great moment for the two of them, because they tend to be two peas in a pod in some ways. After this, the crew all kind of congregate and gather and discuss what they're going to do next. They want to question Ganfer, who was obviously there after what happened in the fight with Shura, but he's unconscious. And then they ultimately decide that 
we're going to go after this treasure. We're going to go after this gold. Um, and Luffy says it's time for adventure, and they're all down. And Robin has this really great smile, and she goes, it sounds like fun. And she is slowly ingratiating herself into the crew. Again, not quite there entirely, but... You know, she's getting closer and closer. The Shandians continue to fight the vassals. At the same time, the crew have this slice-of-life camp stuff. It's very cute. It's very needed. It's some nice respite. And here they put together a plan which essentially entails heading towards uh, the Skull's right eye. So they take the maps of Jaya and the map of Skypia and put them together knowing that they came from the same place. And the island ends up forming a skull. And what did uh, Nolan say? that the treasure resided in the in the skull's right eye. So they decide that they're going to head for the right eye. And Nami takes point in discussing the way forward here, in taking charge and saying, this is the plan, this is what we're going to do. And it just reminds me of how she said earlier in Alabasta, I want to be more contributory, I want to help out more. She is doing everything here. She fights now, she uh, was using the waiver, she took leadership, she helped them get up the knock-up stream, now she's deciding for this this path forward. It's insane. The, the group have saved her in such a way that she feels almost indebted to them, but it's not like an unhealthy sort of thing. At least not yet, I don't think. Um, that, that could potentially change. I think there were some notes of it being unhealthy in Drum Island. But that was solved, and now she is just doing everything, and it's no burden. She does it with a smile, she does it with an eye for adventure, and it really makes me think, you know, in Jaya, she couldn't entirely relate with Luffy and Zoro and their ideals, and she had less confidence in their, her dreams than Luffy and Zoro. Maybe this arc will help change that a little bit? We'll see. Then during this party, uh, they all light a bonfire to celebrate before they take on this quest. And we end up having one of the most unbelievable spreads in the entire series. As there's this party, they meet up with some wolves who end up dancing with them. And it's just this huge, gigantic party uh, the night before they start this excursion. And it's very symbolic because they looked into these bushes or something and they saw these eyes peering back at them. Or uh, that might they might have been behind them. Either way, and this was an unknown. This was a v very much an element of they could be dangerous beasts uh, lurking out here. But they ended up trusting them, and they ended up having a wonderful time. And the wolves were friendly, and they partied with them. And this is an encapsulation of the crew. The unknown can be danger, but they embrace the unknown, and the unknown embraces them back, and they are rewarded. And so people who are too scared or cynical to believe that the unknown can bear fruit are not going to be benefited. But for those who dare to dream in the way that the crew do, they will very much will be. And so we have this wonderful scene that is so emblematic of all of One Piece. And not only that, you know, there's that thematic significance, but it's just uh, it's just a very lively time. It's There's tons of connection. There's tons of great little expressions throughout dancing and Robin smiling and everyone's dance. It, it's just great. Very heartwarming. And again, Jai is the buildup. This is the payoff. This is why they set out on these things. And again, like I said, Robin is looking on smiling, enjoying, and she's not quite part of it. She's always been a little bit outside, but I really hope that she comes to a point where she's able to dance with these people. Or may maybe it could be just a thing in her personality, and that's obviously fine. I'm not the biggest dancer unless you give me a couple drinks. But uh, I really, there is still that hurdle. There is still that barrier between her and the rest of the crew. And she's inching towards it, but I hope she overcomes it soon. Then Ganfer wakes up and he explains some details. He says that Verth is essentially something that comes from the surface or the blue sea. It is a remnant of the land below, and as a result, it is revered. It, it can be Verth can be anything. It can be anything that comes from there. Sky Island cannot grow anything on it, so they use Verth to grow things themselves. And then we go to Isa, who's collecting Verth, and Wiper kind of just slaps the slaps that out of, out of her hand, and he says that we don't we don't have any need for this. We will continue to fight, and we will put an end to 400 years of suffering, uh, and return to the home we lost. So this home we lost, the light of Shandora, they're connected somehow. But Ganfer says that the Verth represents our dreams, and so Isa is collecting this thing that represents their dreams. But Wiper dismisses it. He doesn't want anything to do with it, which shows you a lot about his mindset. After the party, Usopp goes to the bathroom and sees that someone's repaired the ship. He's very freaked out. And then we have a meeting between NL and his vassals, Ohm and Gadatsu, uh, plus someone named Commander Yama. 
and we see Enel for the first time. He has a very interesting aura. He attacks the priests as an introduction just for the hell of it, and he doesn't seem to have much regard for any of his subordinates' lives. He doesn't seem to care much. He just seems to be playing around and playing at God. He's, it's, an, it's an interesting mix of easygoing yet sadistic, and yet he very much feels like he is owed something. They discuss the Straw Hats a little bit, them being after the gold, and then NL says that it's almost time for the Maxim to take flight or something along those lines. And then when it does that, uh, nothing will matter and they'll take off and set out on their own journey of dreams, which is interesting. NL has some sort of dream he wants it to be accomplished, and like the crew, he's doing anything he can to pursue it. Then he says, he wants to do a survival game throughout Upper Yard, where all these people who are here, who are present, will take part, but only five will survive. That's a proclamation he makes. Meanwhile, the Straw Hats divide into two groups. The first is Luffy, Robin, Zoro, and Chopper, and they head for the gold. The second is Nami's group, Pierre, Nami, Sanji, and Usopp, who are going to bring the Going Merry around to pick them up afterwards. Uh, so they explore, uh, Luffy's group explores, Zoro, there are, there are some gags about Zoro getting lost a lot, it's funny. Uh, Robin talks about uh, how Luffy is amusing, and that he's always eager for danger, and that that's funny. Uh, and she calls him by name here. She calls Luffy by name, while she calls the rest of the crew by their occupation or job. Which is, again, interesting. Luffy does seem to hit different for her. And then this huge snake, uh, dragon, serpent thing with an amazing design, uh, with whiskers and just a great design, attacks the crew and it splits them up, and they end up being at different parts of the forest. Now with the other group, with Nami's group, Ganfer tells them the history of the land. He says, excuse me, I'm gonna read it a little bit, because I don't want to get anything wrong here. He says that the upper yard, uh, he used to be the Kami. The Upper Yard appeared in Skypiea 400 years prior. It used to be part of Jaya, obviously. Before then, Skypiea was peaceful. Occasionally, items would ride up from the knock-up stream, uh, and the Sky people cherished them. Um, those objects were called Verth. But the Upper Yard one day came up, and it was this impossible Verth. Uh, it was just inconceivable that something this big would come up, and so they felt that it was a blessing. Now, the Sky people revered this land and tried to take ownership of it, but the Shandians were already inhabiting it, and they were originally from Jaya. And then we see that uh, the Sky People claimed it for their own, and that's what started the war. 400 years because of that. Nami says that it's very sad, Usopp and Sanji kind of say, that's your fault. And Ganfer says, yeah, we're the bad ones. So this story indirectly explains Wiper's attitude. It explains his feelings of loss and the resentment he feels and the rage. It needs to, there needs to be retribution or else nothing will satisfy him. Ganfer then explains that NL overthrew him and then after he did, uh, he took a lot of his old former soldiers, Ganfer's former soldiers, into his employ and they are essentially just prisoners of war that do his bidding um, but don't really want to and, uh, you know, they're just there passing the days away hoping that they can somehow be saved, and Ganfer intends to save them. Now the Shandians go after basically anyone they see in the Cloud Sea because they assume them to be deserters and associate them, don't discriminate, associate them all with the people that are responsible or the descendants of the people responsible for the loss of their homeland. So they see anyone in the Cloud Sea, they don't discriminate, and they go after them like they did to the crew in the beginning. And also, they're just acting out. Uh, it's vengeance. Their loss of their homeland hurts them. And this is all personified through Wiper. He is a great viewpoint into that side of the conflict. And in that way, he's a lot like Koza from Alabasta. And so he longs for this. And Ganfer longs to uh, for the bell to ring, for there to be peace, and to help the, the warriors of his that have been taken in. And you can... You can't hear his voice, obviously, when you're reading manga, but you just sense that there is such a longing in his voice as he talks about this. And so being sort of the privileged side of this, or the people in the wrong, quote-unquote, his people are guilty. And so NL takes advantage of that to run them into the ground and use them and manipulate them. And like Ganfer says, when a person cannot act without feeling guilt, he is at his weakest. NL is just essentially a tyrant. Then we get a flashback to Ganfer trying to resolve this with Wiper and the Shandians, and he really outstretches his arm to him. He offers an olive branch, but Wiper just won't take it. He says that the pain cannot be appeased with this peace. There needs to be retribution. And it's very understandable, you know, is it the smartest thing to do in this situation? No, but it's so human. Again, in a very Koza-esque way. He asks Ganfer for the land back, and Ganfer says, we cannot punish the people who inhabit it, 
because of the sins of the people prior to them, because of the sins of the father. And then Wiper then demands the heads of a hundred innocent people. Obviously, Ganfer says no. He walks away and then he says, I too enjoy the taste of pumpkin juice. And that's a really interesting line because it infuriates uh, Wiper. And there are a couple of different ways that could go. He could be saying, I too enjoy the pumpkin juice in that we are both the same, we come from the same place or we have the same wants, in which case Wiper would obviously be infuriated because of that because he says, no, we're not the same. Look what your people did to me. Ganfer see, wants to see them as the same, Sky People and, uh, and uh, Shandians, but Ganfer just cannot see them as anything other than enemies. We then learn that quite a few of the Shandians, quite a few of Wiper's people, are not really down with how into this retribution idea he is. A lot of them just kind of want to let it go, but they're too scared to speak up. Wiper then encounters Shura, one of the vassals, and he defeats him where Ganfer couldn't using a reject dial. A reject dial is essentially an impact dial, but it delivers the impact 10 times stronger than it was in the first place to great risk to the user. Like, the user can uh, experience great harm for using an impact dial, or even die. So that is his conviction. He's putting his life on the line for this. And in the meantime, Enel again says, only five people will, will survive this survival game. A little bit of an addendum to this is that it's not actually a survival game. People are said to be out of the game when they are just unconscious, so it isn't to the death. It just seems like it's a stay conscious game or something like that. So Ganfer explains what I just said about impact dials to the crew. He also talks about mantra and he says it's the way to sense and hear the voices that come from humans' bodies, uh, human beings' bodies. And the way he explains that it made me think immediately back to Alabasta about number one or Mr. One versus Zoro. When Zoro had that epiphany, did he use mantra? That sounds a lot like what Ganfer is talking about. So did he use Mantra without even realizing what it what he was doing? I think it's probably likely. But Wiper is very badly hurt after using his rejectile. Uh, a lot of the Shandians continue their fight. The commander releases the 50 heavenly warriors of Skypia, which are these half goat men. I don't know, but they're strong. Uh, which is funny because Despite saying how strong they were, one kind of bothers Luffy, and Luffy just dispatches of him like nobody's business in this amazing page turn, this amazing punch. And then he comes up and encounters Wiper. And so at this point, essentially with regards to Luffy's group, all hell is broken loose. They are not finding shit. They can't find each other. They are running around in circles. They don't know what's going on. Luffy's being chased by Wiper. Uh, Chopper is being chased by Heavenly Warriors. Robin, interestingly, dispatches of a warrior who is desecrating some ruins out of respect uh, for those ruins. So again, showing her archaeologist side and the sheer passion she has for this. Wiper then tells Luffy to leave respectively because this place belongs to the Shandians. And Luffy begins to leave, but then Wiper says, let's settle this with our fists. And Zoro then comes up against a guy named Bram, one of the vassals, who he says, this guy's much more tough. And the two begin fighting, but not before expressing some words of respect for the other. And then this fight ensues between Bram and Zoro, and Bram ends up using sort of dials in his feet, or wavers, uh, the waver technology using dials in his feet for mobility. And it's a pretty well-drawn fight, it flows pretty well. Zoro defeats him pretty quickly, all things considered, and he says, uh, sorry, I don't have anything against you, but when I'm told that I'm gonna die, I don't take it lying down. I need to survive and I'll do what it takes, and he'll do what he takes to carry out his dream. Meanwhile, Chopper is looking around and he comes up against Gadatsu, who is going, ho, oh, uh, did this guy lose, or what's going on here? And it seems like they're gearing up for a bit of a fight there. It's a bit of a, a humorous coming together of those two. And then back on the ship, Enel appears out of nowhere, teleports there, and electrocutes Sanji, saying that he's not here for anything personal, but he just wanted to pay a visit to Ganfer, an old friend. And there's a great gag here where Usopp, who's on the ship as well, sees that Sanji's been electrocuted, and he, he hears for a heartbeat, and he can't hear one, and he goes, oh no, Sanji's dead! But then I think Nami maybe says, wrong side. And then he hears on the right side, and then all is well, Sanji has his heartbeat. It's, it's, it's a great gag, I was, I was laughing at it. But then NL takes out Usopp, and then he says, I'm not looking for the ruins of Shandora, I'm looking for the Golden City, El Dorado, the city of gold. Uh, Ganfer isn't aware of this, he mentions the survival game that only five will remain, and he then disappears, and we hear Satori's classical laugh from behind Ganfor and Nami. I don't think I mentioned that, Sat Satori had uh, a very trademark laugh. But an interesting tidbit about the SBS in this issue was that 
Oda was talking about the origin of warlords, and he said that uh, they're based off of privateers, pirates legalized by nations. These people, according to Oda, exist as heroes to some, villains to others, and sometimes the worst type of crimes can be mistaken for justice. It's interesting ambiguity, and it's very important for the themes of this arc, and perspective, and sort of some of the things that Ganfer was talking about before. Luffy and Wiper's mini-fight continues until Luffy falls down into some unknown area. Uh, Robin discovers these ruins that seem to be very ancient relics that may allude to the genuine thing. And she says that this... The, these ruins fall into this 100-year gap with regards to the knowledge of the world. Uh, that they're... This all lines up that this place could hide some secrets, secrets that she's looking for, that this could carry the unspoken history that's not known of in the land below. And it makes you think, is this her salvation? Is this the hope that she needed to think, okay, maybe I can live, maybe there's something worth living for. She said she reached a dead end after 20 years of her research, but is this a light for her? But then she's confronted by Yama. And then we see that Hotori and Kotori, who are triplets with Satori, confront Nami and Ganfer to avenge their brother. The two square up, and uh, it's very cool. Great duo to do this fight. Then there's some slapstick stuff with Chopper, who is looking for his friends, and Gadatsu is told by one of his subordinates that Chopper's one of the ones that he's looking for. Um, he can't see him, though, because his eyes are rolled over and they're white. Then he rolls them back and he sees them, and then he gets angry again and his eyes turn white and he goes, Where the hell did you go, Chopper? It's just very meta, very uh, playing around with the fourth wall. Uh, again, nice bits of respite that I found pretty funny. And then Gidatsu thinks of an introduction to say to Chopper to intimidate him, but he only thinks it. And his minions just say, don't think it, say it out loud. So Gadatsu's essentially Oda playing around and having fun with the fourth wall in a really interesting and entertaining way. And I was, I was a fan of it. They go back and forth and Chopper runs away, but then he eventually says, I'm tired of running away. And then he thinks to himself that all, everyone always bails him out. He can't be relied upon for anything, and that's why he is unable to stand on his own two feet. But he says right here, I will fight, I won't back down. Now is time to step up and raise the pirate's flag. And he says, I'm a monster. I'm strong. He says this to Gadatsu. It's self-validation, because the, the, the word monster beforehand only ever had negative connotations for Chopper. He would think of it, and it would bring him back to his trauma, and he'd be disturbed. But Luffy and Hiroluk, they used that term endearingly. They looked at it as something interesting and positive. They put a positive spin on it. And here is the first time Chopper himself is able to look at himself and say, Yes, loud and proud, I am a monster, and he is strong. Because of it, because of his friends, and he is able to self-accept here. He's able to accept the person that he is, or the reindeer, whatever you want to call it, that he is. And it's a beautiful moment, because this is a huge turning point in his life. At the end of Drum Island, it was a, it was huge for him. But this is the first time where he properly comes into his own for what he is. This outsider, as Ganfer talked about before. And, you know, in a Game of Thrones-esque theme, never forget who you are. Use it. Wield it. Here Chopper is able to harness who he is and use it, and it becomes his strength. And this is the best Chopper moment post-Drum Island for me. Pretty easily. And he defeats Gadatsu. And he proclaims that he's a real pirate now. He finds the ruin and he says, maybe I should just wait for them over here. Uh, Chopper does a lot in quite a small amount of time, so he's definitely earning his wages. In the meantime, NL confronts Kamakiri and very bored looking he says i'll give you five minutes to hit me i won't move uh reminds me of sir crocodile saying to luffy you have three minutes to defeat me and, and i won't attack you uh very similar very prideful again very mocking we then go to nami and ganfer who essentially finish the fight nami has a great moment a uh, very taunting moment and she's very much continuing to come into her own and they defeat Satori's brothers, or triplets, or whatever. Notable that there is a fart dial during this fight. I'd be amiss if I didn't mention that. Uh, and then at the same time, Robin is having trouble with the commander Yuma. Then we go back to Pagaya, Konis, and Isa, who are searching um, for the Straw Hat ship. We see here that Isa's ability to tap into that mantra to a great degree is not necessarily completely positive exclusively. She's able to hear the voices and uh, listen for the people and hear them completely be shut out one after another as they go unconscious or die. And it's horrifying to her, as it should be. You know, that is a profound amount of trauma that she's experiencing there as she sees or hears 
uh, lives being shut out. And then Pagaya and Konis continue to try to search for their ship to try and help the Straw Hats. But Ganfer, after defeating uh, those two, leaves Nami and says that she should take care of Usopp and Chopper, or Usopp and Sanji, excuse me, and he says, I need to take on NL. Like, this is the fight, this is what I have to be doing. Uh, Konus and Bagaya find them, and Nami and Isa strike up this interesting, cute little adversarial dynamic where, where Isa says, oh, you're a blue sea person? I'll, I challenge you as a warrior. And Nami says, uh, I'll hit you with this impact dial in this glove that she gets from Ganfer. Uh, it's just pretty adorable. So this Robin versus Yama fight continues, and then Yama ends up saying, uh, mocking essentially, the relics of the past that they are trampling all over and destroying. And then Robin says, you have no respect for the footprints of ancient people. And he says, of course not, I don't care. And she says, fools who don't respect the past are doomed to repeat it. And this line feels huge for Robin. It's a great line, it's one I agree with, and I think it applies not just to history on a grand scale, but it could potentially apply to her, to her, her backstory, where she comes from, these mistakes that she has maybe repeated, or maybe she knows someone, but it feels like a personal quote, and I can't wait to, like, we're putting a pin in that, but I can't wait to see if that applies to her in other ways. The NL Kamakiri fight continues, and we see eventually that Kamakiri has no hope. NL is lightning, he says, and he is basically invulnerable. He gets stabbed through the head, but he just disappears because he is this lightning force, and he just reappears somewhere else. Similar to Sir Crocodile again. He calls himself godly, he talks about divine providence, he says, how can a man hope to defeat lightning? And he just destroys and roasts Kamakiri with his volts. And this electricity travels and goes down the milky road, and apparently silences 20 voices. Uh, which may be the, the deafening silence that Isa was talking about earlier. But we see, as we're given some statistics, 81 people started the hunt, 2 hours later, 56 have fallen, 13 remain from the Kami's forces, 7 from the Shandians, 5 from the Straw Hats, 25 total. Usab and Sanji don't count because they're unconscious. And uh, then we quickly see that Luffy, the place where he was dropped into after fighting with Wiper, he has found some treasure. And so I hypothesized here, did he just stumble into El Dorado, into this golden city? Then we catch up a little bit with Isa and why she was with Konis and Pagaya. She was traveling, her waiver get, got attacked by Skyfish, then the other two saved her. And she doesn't know why she sought them out, but she says she had to do something, she had to act. And it's just a, I don't know, it's a lovely little divergence between her and Wiper. She doesn't agree with him, but she still needs to act and just the idea of having to go out and do something. She's, she's aimless, she doesn't know what to do, but she has to act somehow. It's very relatable, I think. It's a very human thing for her to do, especially this little girl. And then she quickly says about Mantra, she's had an affinity with Mantra since birth. And here, despite kind of playing around with Isa and having this antagonistic dynamic with her, Nami looks on very sympathetically, because Nami can think about and empathize with the idea of the cries of all these people she cares about being silenced. She can relate to that sort of pain. She tried to avoid that sort of pain. Uh, Luffy continues to be stuck in this old cave with all this treasure. We go to Zoro and he's being followed by a south bird. He gets very aggravated and he picks a fight with this south bird. And then we go back to Robin versus Yuma. And Robin is kind of dodging him and she says that she won't forgive him for what he's done. For desecrating these relics. And she says it's time that you felt the burden of the history you destroyed. She says that what you destroyed was precious, and history is always repeating, but we can never return to the past. So there is a permanence to the sort of damages that he is bringing about. Again, is that an allusion to something that happened with her before? It seems to have deeper meaning to her. And she says, I don't forgive you, so I'm gonna kill you. And she tosses him off a cliff, and she says, you do such horrible things, and then moves on. And it was here where I think I said to my chat, Robin is growing and growing and growing as a character, and she has probably the most gradual growth as a character, but it is just consistently getting better and better, and more substantial, and I am really liking the approach that uh, Robin is taking. And she is one of the protagonists for this arc, I would say. Luffy is kind of sidelined for a great portion of it, but Robin is one of the primary protagonists here, and here she makes her way into the center of these ruins, this old civilization, and she assumes that this is El Dorado. So I guess that Luffy didn't stumble into El Dorado. But then she corrects herself, and she says, no, this isn't right. The topography, the geography, the shape, everything's all wrong. Chopper, who is going through a lot this arc, then runs into another vassal, Ohm, 
and his dog, uh, Holly, or Holy. Ohm introduces himself, he had just dispatched of a couple people, He's and he talks about how he truly laments human weakness, and how they all fight each other searching for some sort of meaning. And he says the solution to that is they all must die, and he says he offers the way forward. And he offers and he offers salvation, quote-unquote, to Chopper. Rocky then finds Kamakiri, who is just totally beaten up and roasted, and just, he's on the verge of death, it seems like, and he says, make sure that Wiper does not fight NL. It is a fool's errand, he will not survive. We then learn that NL has a Rumble Rumble fruit, uh, a Logia fruit, Logia-type fruit, which is interesting. And Zoro is just being laughed at by this southern bird. He goes back to the altar, he says, is this deja vu when he's just literally going in circles? The bird steals his backpack thinking there's food in there, but there isn't. Zoro is having a tough time. We cut quickly to Luffy, who is in this strange cave and feels a rumbling. Uh, some sort of rumbling. And then we go back to Ohm and Chopper, and Ohm tells Chopper that life is only a path to sadness. He has a lot of very edgy... Uh, philosophical things to tell Chopper about. But then he readies an attack which he says will definitely defeat Chopper. So, eventually, we see that that huge snake from before with the whiskers, with a great design, it actually just swallowed Luffy. Luffy fell into its mouth, he's in its stomach, the treasures are in its stomach, and the rumbling that he feels is when the snake moves around. Amazing misunderstanding. Nami and Isa kind of go into the forest to escape this snake, uh, I believe. Zoro has his hijinks with his bird, uh, he, the bird drops him, he's He's being carried by it, but the bird drops him because the bird thinks that the snake is after Zoro. Wiper makes his way towards NL, and then we have Zoro, Wiper, Ganfer, and Ohm all preparing to face off in the upper ruins, all facing each other in this amazing spread, insanely good spread. Uh, just awesome, super raw, and you can see from all the different perspectives, the detail's great. It's, it's a great spread. All of them about to fight for their respective causes, while Luffy is just trying to get out of the damn snake. He's just pounding against it, and it's some, sometimes it tickles the snake, sometimes it uh, disturbs them or makes them feel sick. And, uh, you know, Luffy has got his own side adventures going on here. And then a nice little no moment, though, is that uh, as Nami and Isa are sort of traveling, or traversing, there's a moment where Nami shows care for Isa and saves her from death, essentially, and there are some looks and some key lines that really remind me of Nojiko. So, just a nice little detail there of how Nojiko told that kid in Arlong Park, you better value your life. Nami essentially teaches Isa the same thing. The snake ends up going to the upper ruins because it followed Zoro, so Luffy's there as well. Uh, the battle begins in the upper ruins. Robin continues through her ruins, and uh, we get introduced to the fact that there is a giant beanstalk, which I think it was called Giant Jack? Uh, this giant beanstalk that leads up and up and up in Skypiea. But the fights continue in their respective places, and then Robin eventually finds herself face to face with Shandora, and she just takes it in, wide-eyed, wonder, and just sits down and just observes it and soaks it in, and there are no words needed in this beautiful, beautiful spread as she just pauses and reflects. The fight continues between the four, uh, and more. Nami and Isa appear riding the waver, and they're being chased by enemies, and Zoro takes a moment to uh, protect Nami and stop the enemies that are that are going after them in a really lovely moment. And then Ganfer and Pierre uh, rescue Nami and Isa from, from their pursuers and everything, only for all of them to be swallowed by the snake. And Luffy continues to try to get out of the snake. And honestly, Luffy is being reduced to this sort of side role, this this comedy role here, as he's literally just not doing anything aside from giving the snake some belly aches. But I like that a lot, because it gives lots of agency to the other characters who maybe don't get as much time to shine. And Luffy being, you know, sidelined a bit, it gives a lot of spotlight to Nami, to Robin, to uh, Zoro. It gives some stuff to Chopper as well, to Wiper, Ganfer, and it's, I think it's really needed. I think it keeps things fresh, I think it keeps the perspective, it keeps you guessing in a really good way. So I'm glad that Luffy isn't front and center of every single arc, um, or at least up until now in Skypiea, the first 40 chapters, because that would get a little monotonous. So the countdown continues for this survival game. At this point, it's 10 people and 2 animals left, so it's getting pretty damn close to uh, NL's proclamation. A cage is dropped down to trap the combatants, and Zoro, being very raw, says, no need to use a cage on me, uh, there's no point, 
I would never run away. But then in the midst of all this, Rocky comes to warn Wiper to not challenge NL because of what Kamakiri told her. Then NL promptly shocks her, and it's unclear the seriousness of this or the severity, but she is out of commission. And NL, perching himself up, you know, uh, putting himself above others, says to Wiper that he's small fry, and that all that are not equal to him are lambs in his eyes. Inside the serpent, they find Luffy, which is great. Poor boy, he's finally been found. Hopefully he gets some more uh, stuff to do now for him, for his sake. But like I said, not a problem at all with the story. In fact, I really like it. And then Nami does some more great Nojiko caring after Isa stuff, which I just think, I think that's something she picked up from Nojiko. I don't know, I may be reaching, but seems like it to me. Then the crew inside the snake essentially tell Luffy what's happened, um, that he is inside the snake. He didn't realize this, and then they realize that the reason that the snake was being so erratic was because of him screwing with its stomach inside. Uh, then they all call him an idiot. It's again great fun. But during this time, uh, Wiper's trying to get to cut the snake's belly open to get to Isa, um, and Zoro is trying to save the people inside the snake. So kind of what someone in the AGP's comments was saying earlier as well, fighting to protect, to protect the ones he cares about. Ohm kind of cuts him off and says to Zoro to pray to God, and Zoro just says that he will never pray to God. But the fight continues. This is just a raw fest, basically. And then we go back to Robin. Uh, she's observing Shandora, and she finds similar ruins that are reminiscent of the Poneglyph. She reads something about this bell, this bell that Noland mentions in his notes as being this beautiful bell, and, you know, that immediately makes you think of Ganfer and the bell he was talking about. And in addition to that, Robin learns that the Poneglyph was brought back to this city after a war was fought uh, to hide it from, quote-unquote, the enemy. And this city was just decimated as a result of this protection for it. And so looking at this relic and this town and whatever, she concludes that the Poneglyph she is specifically looking for, the answer that she needs, was with the bell that was originally in this city. But now she can't find the bell. Uh, there just happens to be this giant stock, this giant jack. And so she needs to find that for this secret, but doesn't know how to quite get there yet. Then Enel shows up and talks about the magnificence of Shandora and how he wants the Golden Bell as well, which is interesting that he is going after dreams, as was established earlier, but totally goes against what those dreams really mean for all involved. The spirit and sentiment of his cause is totally different than the spirit of Luffy and his friends, and yet he is after this thing that seems to represent these impossible dreams at the same time. It's a really interesting sort of subversion, and the more the two talk, the more they realize that the bell is probably somewhere in the sky as well, and they both want to search for it. Meanwhile, Konus and Bagaya are rushing through, and they find this soldier that works for Enel on the brink of death that tells them, you have to warn everyone. Enel is going to bring all of Skypiea down, and everyone is going to die. Please warn these people. Enel is going to try to bring uh, all of Skypiea down to the seas, crashing it down. And he's going to escape on his Ark Maxim. Now, Enel strikes them with lightning, but right at the opportune moment, Pagaya pushes Konus out of the way and sacrifices himself to save her. Now, that doesn't feel like a death to me, but we'll see where that goes. Uh, I don't, I'm not convinced that Pagaya's dead, but yeah, we'll see. The survival game has reached very close to its end, which signals that the destruction will now ensue. Uh, so Enel begins crashing things down, uh, crashing some of these clouds down, and the descent of Skypiea begins. And at the same time, Konus is rushing as much as she can to try to send the word out to everyone about what's going to happen so that they can somehow survive and evacuate. So Skypiea begins to experience a bunch of destruction. The crew eventually make their way out of the snake. Everyone who was in the snake make their way out, but Luffy and Isa get separated from everyone else. Eventually, we come to a point where this snake, this serpent, sees the old ruins, Shandora, and lets out this howl, this cry, uh, this mournful cry that seems to resonate with everyone, or at least impact everyone, I should say, because Enel is very much annoyed with it, but it just feels like this mournful, mournful, painful cry that this serpent lets out, and it reminded me immediately of Laboon. Now, we know with Laboon that they were crying for their crew and their old friends and the people that they, they uh, traveled the sea with. Is there something similar here with this serpent? Because the cry is so reminiscent of it. Is it mourning the loss of some sort of dream? Is it mourning the loss 
uh, of its home like the Shandians did because it takes a look at this old place and immediately cries. So one plus one equals two. It has some sort of sad emotional connection to this. And this place is the ruins of Shandora, which is their, the Shandians lost land. It seems to make sense to me. But either way, it's a deeply impactful moment that I found very striking. And it really took me aback. And Nami notices that not only is it screaming, but it's crying. And my heart really goes out for, for this serpent without knowing exactly why. And I'm really interested to understand why. NL then shocks, uh, electrocutes this serpent because it's making a ruckus and it's annoying him or whatever. And he says, I proclaim that five people would survive this game. There are six of us left. Those six being NL, Nami, uh, Robin, Ganfer, Wiper, and Zoro. And he says, one more has to fall for my proclamation to be correct. Who's it going to be? And Nami is kind of hiding behind uh, in a role that I really love for her again, because, you know, it is it very much is in keeping with Nami's character to be hiding at this point. So Nami's hiding, but then we have the other four who all look at each other and show their weapons to him and go, it's you who's going to be taken down. And it's an amazing panel to end off the chapter at. And we get a flashback after this to Ganford during his rule. He reflects on the war with the Shandians and himself and his people, and he wonders if he is the bad guy due to his decadence and the lives being built over the misery of the Shandians of the past. His advisors tell him that it's his duty to continue the battle in the present and protect the people that he is supposed to protect now. Uh, so he doesn't really have a choice, but nonetheless he is still conflicted about this. Uh, apparently they've negotiated continuously, but there are no terms for peace which will be accepted by the Shandians. And Ganfer laments the fact that things had to come to this and says, if we had lost all that time ago, we would be in this position. How volatile and flimsy these circumstances can be. Then there's a call from a guard saying that some man named NL has invaded. So that was exactly prior to Ganfer being usurped. Then we get a nice little perspective from some kids who are outside Konis' house who are talking about her being this bad woman who defied the Kami. And one of the kids talks about his dad, who is a soldier working for the, for the Kami, for NL. And he says, I haven't met my dad yet, but he's going to come home soon. And he's a great soldier and a great man. And he's just beaming with pride. This kid has never met his father. This kid's got to be seven or eight years old or something. Never met his dad because of, or I guess maybe six, because of how long NL's been in charge. I don't know. Either way, he's never met his dad because his dad's been working for NL. And yet he's okay with that and been indoctrinated to think that this is something that he should be prideful about. But the real sting in the tale is that we then cut to Konis thinking about that warrior, uh, the heavenly warrior, or the, the guy who was working for NL that told her, you gotta save Skypiea, tell people to evacuate. And this ended up being that kid's dad. So that kid will never meet his dad. And this just shows the long-reaching ramifications of this sort of indoctrination. Pain, uh, fathers being se separated from their families, families being torn apart, kids growing out with kids growing up without uh, family, without parents, uh, just general death. But I think it's important that his last meaningful contribution was one preserving peace, uh, trying to save people. Then Enel kind of mocks the warriors confronting him and talks about their futility, saying, an old relic yearning for happiness in Skypea, a warrior searching blindly for his homeland, Ganfer and Wiper uh, respectively, Blue Sea Pirates hunting for gold, Robin and Zoro. And he mocks this, again carrying forward the torch of uh, Croc, of Bellamy, of mocking these dreams, because he lists their endeavors, and those are improbable dreams that he seems to mock. There is this cynicism here. Despite gunning for dreams himself, he says, Oh, you're this old relic hoping for peace. You're looking for your homeland. Uh, you're searching for treasure, you're these, these pirates. He mocks them and says that it's futile. And that is what the Straw Hats have been up against 
from the start, especially in Jaya. And he alludes to the fact that the world seems to hold no hope for people with these dreams. And then NL discusses his goal. He talks about this place that has limitless birth. He says that this place uh, is where God lives. It's the place where he was born. It's where legends are told of, and he calls this fairy birth. He talks about returning back to the blue sea, and he says that everything here is unnatural. It's unnatural for people to be living in the sky. It's unnatural to be up here, and so he wants to bring things back to their natural state. And that kind of keys in with that theme of balance, of equilibrium. In NL's eyes, Skypia is unnatural, and he states that gods and men, they have a place and it is on the earth. And Ganfer realizes that this means that he's going to try to crash Skypia back down, and is horrified. And NL continues to talk about this as this sort of natural law, but Ganfer just continues to defy him and says that God is just a title given to the leader of countries and kingdoms like him. Enel responds saying that he became a god, and Ganfer replies saying, there is no need for gods. Enel kind of taunts uh, Ganfer, reminding him of his soldiers that have come into his employ, and saying that they, uh, kind of hinting at the fact that they're probably dead, saying that six of them, only six, remain on the island compared to all that time ago. Ganfor is provoked, he can't hear any more of this, he lunges, uh, but then he's shocked, and he thinks back to the moment where he was usurped and defeated by NL. He sees them all looking down at him, the vassals, and he just remembers being cast out like this. And everyone looks on stunned, but the most interesting expression to me was that of Wiper, who looks at him with fondness and goes, old man. That is definite fondness there. There is definite affection there. And as much as he says, I hate this guy, when it comes down to it, seeing him on the brink of death like this, he cannot stomach it. But NL says, now that Ganfer is gone, there's five of us, and that is the number that I proclaimed, and you are now the chosen ones, just this arbitrary number that he came up with. You are the winners of the survival game, and so you can come with me to this new world. You can survive, because you're the strong. Very meritocratic. And interesting that he has these principles. He only wanted the strong, hence the survival game. But now that he's come to it, he's not going to betray them. He genuinely wants them to come with him. Robin asks what happens if they refuse, and he just shocks her. There's a great use of negative space and white backgrounds as Robin is shocked like this. And it's Zoro has an interesting expression in response to this, because... He, like we said before, he's never trusted Robin, but he shows concern for her here. And he defends her, and he grabs her before, she's fall, before she falls over, and he says, she's a woman. And so we see here that this is due to his past. His inability to fight Tashigi doesn't just have to do with the fact that she is reminiscent of Quina. It, ju it also has to do with the fact that she's, like, all women have this effect on Zoro. He cannot fight them. I don't know the specifics, but it's clear that, likely due to Quina, he cannot fight women because uh, maybe he doesn't, like I said, maybe he wants that idealized image of who she was to remain. Um, maybe all of them remind him of that, and so that integrates. I don't know exactly, but this is a very important aspect of his character that's brought to light here, uh, and the specificity, or lack thereof, is notable. So he's very upset, he attacks NL, and he says he won't go with him, he says screw your world of dreams, I don't want to go with you, and Nami warns him not to attack, she stays pragmatic, but in illustrating the differences between the two, Zoro just continues, and he defeats Zoro, and NL says something really interesting, he says that having all of your hopes shattered is not unlike death, which is very similar to the sort of thing that Luffy and Zoro stand for. Ideals being crushed is death, or worse than death, you know? Interesting little note there. And then NL says something that I was talking about earlier on as a theme. He says that when humans experience fear, they fall in line. Fear is their motivator, and fear makes them bow down to a superior f uh, power and fall in line. And that is essentially the core of this doctrine. But then out of nowhere, we hear someone say, do you know what a sea prism is to NL? And then Wiper comes out and attacks him, and he has one attached to his rejectile, and NL says, this is gonna kill you, and he kinda calls his bluff, but Wiper says, I'll happily die if it means taking care of you. Then we see a flashback where we see, as children, Wiper, uh, Kamakiri, Genbo, Bram, they were all told the story of uh, their Shandian ancestors defending the stone tablet years and hundreds of years in the past, and due to the will of their survivors, they forever guard this tablet, even, uh, even now. Then it was revealed that their part of Jaya, the upper yard, blasted up into the sky. 
uh, 400 years prior. So that's a confirmation that uh, Jaya didn't descend, the other part of Jaya that became the Upper Yard ascended. But then their ancestors were unable to defend uh, their land, and they lost, and so it was overtaken. And so that's what leads to their situation today. Now, a chief is telling them all this all this story, and he says that they've lost so much, so many things in, uh, in losing their homeland, and notably, they've lost the light of Shandora. And it said, hold the truth in your heart. We are the ones who weave history. And we go back to the present for a second, and we see all these people that defeated, the crew, Wiper, Ganfer. We go back to the past. Wiper dwells about all these things, all these things that he'd been taught as he sees uh, Enel's body after the rejectile impact. But then Enel shocks himself with electricity, restarting his heart, and essentially resurrects himself. And he says that people do not fear God, God is fear, or fear is God itself. So the existence of a God, this oppressive existence of a God, is fear itself. Rulers like this are fear itself. Uh, his ideas of leadership is that leaders are to be worshipped and feared. And this connects thematically back to the examples of bad rulers throughout the series. Uh, Sir Crocodile, no trust in anything. Wapple, totally cold, devoid of any heart. Um, and so we see his ideas of leadership and what God means connects back to that idea. So that's a consistent theme throughout One Piece of what leadership means and what it means to be a ruler and how there must be heart. And they all wonder, what the hell is this guy? And Wiper is just on his last legs. And NL kind of taunts him and says, what a shame, warrior Wiper. To which Wiper says, don't use my name in vain. And he's roughly drawn, great shadowing, Oh, amazing panel, amazing line. Wiper is so raw. He's so he has such conviction and determination and perseverance, and he stays standing after who knows how many rejectile impacts, just trying to defend and acquire this dream. He talks about the history of their ancestors and uh, how there's this duty imposed upon him that they have to take back the light of Shandora, and that NL is all that stands in his way between that. It's right in front of him. And Zoro and Wiper stand up again, continue to fight him, and and uh, NL just says, why do you fight? In that line, you know, that's continuously repeated throughout the series, often to Luffy, why do you fight? When all is all hope is lost, why do you fight? Can you not see that it's futile? But there is no futility for these people. They will continue to protect what they need to protect. But NL asks that, and Wiper answers for my ancestors. And Wiper then thinks back, and this is killing me, to a flashback of, again, that chief, the elder chief, talking to him about the warrior Kalgara, their ancestor. And he says that Kalgara had something. But then the flashback cuts out. So, the ancestor had something? I have no idea what, but he had something. And it's very important, and it cuts out right when Wiper is defeated. Wiper inherits this will of the light of Shandora, and brings it onto himself and it becomes his dream and he protects it to the last breath but he's defeated here he doesn't die but he's defeated and what do we say about ideals being crushed but at this point nami is the only one left she has been hiding this entire time and unlike zoro and wiper who fight until their death she is unable to do that illustrating again a difference between her and these people who fight for their dreams in this way and Again, it illustrates this that this difference is there, and I think it's very important for her character, and I love that she acts this way. So she's hiding the whole time, and she comes up to him, and she says, uh, Hey, I'll join you. I'll join you on your boat to preserve her life. Now, obviously, she does that uh, probably with the uh, endeavor of escaping or betraying him. She's not going to join his crew and try to be part of his crew. You notably see in her face the same heartbroken expression that we see when she tells the rest of Arlong, uh, the rest of her village in Arlong Park as a kid that she's going to go with Arlong. So she's heartbroken. She doesn't want to do this, but she has to to survive. She is not willing to throw her life away. As Belmere told her, your life is precious, and as long as you're alive, there is potential for happiness. So she values this. She doesn't want to die. And so I love how this connects back to Arlong Park very cohesively. It's an awesome Nami moment. Though it's so heartbreaking and dark, it's still great. And NL understands that she's going due to fear, but kind of likes it, as you would expect, and says, good, fall in line. 
you uh, you can come with me. Now, at the same time, Conus continues to go towards town to spread the news to everyone, and the White Berets are spreading propaganda, pro-Kami propaganda uh, throughout the town. So Conus arrives, and the White Berets see her, call her a blasphemer, people kind of look down on her, metaphorically and literally, but she persists and tells these people, uh, very admirable for Konis. She is, she has a great uh, role throughout this arc so far. But elsewhere, Nami takes her waiver and joins NL, and he shows her the Ark Maxim, this gigantic ship that's going to be their Ark. You know, the religious symbolism is very clear. And Nami sees that it floats in the sky, and so it'll be very difficult for her to escape. Um, so we see it's confirmed she had plans to escape, as if we needed that confirmed. But meanwhile, uh... Luffy, Isa, and Pierre, who has who went to Luffy and Isa under Ganfer's or orders earlier on, find the rest of the party uh, incapacitated. Zoro, Robin, everyone. Isa sees Wiper there. She's very upset. And a cool little detail is that she didn't know this because her mantra doesn't work while she was in the snake. It was blocked off. And then Robin warns Luffy. Enel's going to bring everything down, she tells him. And Isa at this moment can sense two souls, and Luffy knows it's... Enel and Nami, and Luffy then says, take me to them. He means business here, and the chapter ends with them uh, about to go, I guess Issa's going to take him, to Nami and Enel, going towards what I assume will be this final confrontation, or this climax. And that's the last chapter I read of this portion. I don't know how much is left, it really feels like we're getting towards the end of the arc, but there has to be a substantial portion left for it to be advised for me to end right here, so... Um, I'm ending right here, and it was a great spot to end, a great cliffhanger. I think there's plenty of substance, plenty of things to conclude thematically, like I said, doctrine, culture, that alternate perspective, uh, the idea of balance, uh, pride in leaders and rulers and the nuances of that. It's all done really well, and I look forward to seeing how it gets carried through. There have been some great character introductions, like I said, Wiper's my favorite, but NL is a very striking antagonist. Konis is great, uh, I like Pagaya as well. Don't think he's dead, but we'll see. Yeah, like I said, the pacing is slow to start, but I like that gradual opening for uh, immersing us in this new setting, and showing us this culture that's been embedded and indoctrinated into Skypiea. Then again, there's always that theme of the crew being against cynicism, and that theme of that far-off dream that's shared between Ganfer and uh, Wiper and the crew as well, and maybe even Enel in some sort of way, through his dream of the natural order, or what his dream is, which is very interesting. And then there's that perspective of heroes in one time can be considered villains in another that's brought up. It's very dense, it's very dense with a lot of themes, and uh, you know, I've seen a lot of people say that Skypiea is very hit or miss. Some people have told me that it's kind of mid throughout, that it's not very substantial. I totally disagree. I've talked about this for a lot. Like, this video is super long, and I don't think I've been very redundant. I've talked about a lot of stuff here. So, yeah, I think this has been a great first half or two-thirds or whatever it is uh, of Skypiea and it's been very solid, and I look forward to seeing more. If it continues along this trajectory, I could see it being a top 5 arc so far. Um, so yeah, Skypiea, definitely a fan. Uh, I don't have any character rankings because we're not done the arc. I'll have them for you at the end of uh, Skypiea Part 2. But yeah, uh, like I said again, I'm glad that Luffy's in the background. It gives other characters moments to shine. Robin, Nami, Zoro, Ganfer, Wiper. It gives some great vari variability, and it keeps things fresh. And I think... I think that Nami will have a lot of growing in this last little bit, uh, hopefully. Robin too, I'd say. Both both Nami and Robin, I think, will play pretty significant roles towards the end of this arc. And then I think Luffy's coming into prominence now too. I think he's done being the side character for Skypiea. And yeah, NL's really cool. I think, I like that he's got this different vibe to Sir Crocodile, but a lot of similar themes as well to show this consistent through line with thematic antitheses uh, as villain throughout the series. Someone in chat said that he's like Sir Crocodile, but that he's got the confidence of someone who's never really had to work hard for something, who expects things to be given to him. And I think that's a very interesting contrast between him and Sir Crocodile, because what did Sir Crocodile try to point out to Luffy? I've worked hard to get to where I am. He definitely wanted people to understand that he worked hard. Uh, NL, I don't get that vibe from, which is an interesting contrast, like I said. But yeah, we'll see where things go. As for what I'm hoping for, I hope we get uh, some more backstory for the history, because we have some pieces, but I don't think we have the full puzzle yet. Uh, I want to know what the Chief said about Kalgara to uh, Wiper. I'm sure that'll be revealed. And I want to know more... <sighs> 
I want some more wiper stuff. I know he's on his last legs, but I would like a bit more, uh, because I just think he's awesome. And I just think, I hope that whatever we get concludes things in a hopefully poetic, thematically rich, poignant way. I think there's the potential for this climax to be something quite special. So I hope it is. I hope it measures up to that of Alabasta, or Jaya, or uh, Arlong Park, or whatever. And we'll see. But yeah, that's all I got for today, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, if you would like early access to the next video, to Skypea Part 2, uh, you can watch that right now, just through getting early access through my Patreon. You can follow my Twitch for the live read-throughs. You can follow me and get notified for whenever I go live with One Piece. And uh, you can check out the Discord server as well. Lastly, if you want your comment to be highlighted in the next video, just use the hashtag AJPeace. That's all I got, guys. Uh, I really look forward to the end of Skypea, and I hope to see you guys there. Many thanks for watching.